Good morning. Welcome everyone to the Macaque Coalition's online event on contraception in wild macaques. It's 11 a.m. in Jakarta, and this is a five hour long event. Unfortunately for me, I'm in the UK and it's extremely early in the morning. And so, for the moment, so we can be as clear as possible, I've pre-recorded this introduction. The use of contraception, both permanent and impermanent methods, is a really important subject for those dealing with macaques in captivity, but also it can play a big role in the management of wild and free roaming macaque populations. On the surface, it might seem straightforward. Negative interactions with people are, of course, the result of macaque overpopulation. So if you just sterilize some monkeys, the problem will be solved. Of course, in reality, it's far from straightforward and careful consideration is needed about the precise nature of the situation and what the desired outcomes are. The practice can also have ecological and welfare consequences, and these are not always properly considered and they're not always properly understood either. You'll hear a lot more about this during today's three presentations. First, I'll give you a brief background about who we are. The Macaque Coalition is a working group of the Asia for Animals Coalition, which is composed of 25 animal protection organizations that work in Asia, of which six organizations form the board, who are the ultimate decision makers for the coalition. Among other work, the AFA Coalition organizes a big animal protection conference every two years. The next one is scheduled for 2023 in Borneo and we're really excited about it. Beyond the core member organizations, there are over 200 network member organizations whose involvement with coalition activities vary and who are all regularly offered the opportunity to sign on to coalition appeals and to join relevant working groups that focus on specific issues or animal species. Members of each working group, like the Macaque Coalition, may split off to work on yet more specific issues. For example, if there's sufficient interest, this event could serve to initiate a working group looking specifically at contraception. Here's the current core membership of the coalition. I believe that a few of you attending today are core members, and as you will see, there is crossover between core membership and Macaque Coalition membership. The Macaque Coalition itself was initiated in 2020 in response to a particularly high volume of macaque related issues that kept arising. We aim to serve as a first stop resource for organizations that are concerned about macaques but not sure where to go for advice or where to access resources that will help them address whatever issue they're facing. We help them make connections with other organizations or with re relevant researchers, primatologists or other professionals. We work hard to encourage collaborative working and we collate resources um, make them available on our website and we keep our eyes open for arising matters of concern. Here you can see the 19 Macaque Coalition member organizations, some of which are also AFA core organizations, um, and hidden beneath me is Wild Welfare. So just like the AFA coalition in general, the Macaque Coalition sometimes appeals to governments and authorities on behalf of macaques and in support of our network members work. Uh, you can see here that the latest couple of appeals went pretty well. Um, one of them we hope contributed to the halt of Japan's plans to capture a group of wild macaques and to send them on to Uruguay as diplomatic gifts. The previous appeal to the government of Taiwan was soon followed by an announcement that their wild macaques will receive greater legal protection. Both of these appeals were carried out in support of AFA network member organizations work in their own countries um, and we basically were able to just garner the support of, of uh, organizations worldwide and across Asia to, um, just to lend their voice to, to the appeal. A few other examples of our work are here. Our website 
though it is in need of an update, it makes a variety of resources available. For example, there's a bibliography that links to hundreds of macaque related ar articles, both from popular media and from peer reviewed scientific publications. Um, there's also a guide to the different macaque species and, and quite a few other things there. It's really worth exploring. We're also about to publish the Ma Macaque Report Indonesia, which was written by a subgroup of organizations that have specific focus on Indonesian issues and who have noticed a pronounced uptick in the exploita exploitation of two macaque species in particular since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Long-tailed macaques and southern pigtail macaques have both been uplisted to endangered very recently, which is concerning. We hope that this report will shine a light on some of the serious harms that are being done to them and perhaps inspire a change. This isn't our first event. Last year, we held two online events in July and in December. Neither of these focused on one specific theme, but they each presented a variety of work from anti-trafficking efforts to the importance of field research to macaque welfare. You can watch these sessions on the AFA Coalition's YouTube page where this is currently live streaming and where recordings of today's event will later be available. And so on to today's event. Um, we have a really interesting lineup of speakers today. Each of the three presentations is going to be given by a pair of experts, beginning with Serjana and Dinesh from the Federation of Indian Animal Protection Organizations. Um, they're going to be discussing uh, some long running programs in India and talking about some welfare concerns that accompany those programs. Um, Paolo and Carthy Martelli will follow from the Ocean Park Conservation Foundation in Hong Kong, and they have for many years been running what is probably the most successful sterilization program for macaques. And they've got a wealth of experience to share and, and a lot of really, really good insights. And they're then, then going to be followed by Fanny and Gwenin from the University of Liège, pardon my pronunciation, um, and they have been conducting some very, very interesting research on um, the social effects of sterilization on groups of macaques, which obviously has a huge amount of um, welfare impact. So that's really important to our subject today. Um, after, the, after all these presentations are done and the questions and comments section is finished, Philip Yip from the Hong Kong Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department will also be joining the panel to discuss everything afterwards. So today's event is designed a little unusually. So there will not be question and answer sessions immediately following the individual presentations. But once all the presentations have been finished, the floor will be opened to those of you who are registered and who are participating today via Zoom so in this 30 minute session, anyone who wants to pose a question or a comment on what's been discussed can raise their hand as I as I will show you in a few minutes um, how to do that. And they'll be called upon to do so. Questions and comments will then be collected and compiled and condensed into themes. And these themes will then inform the panel discussion that will follow the 20 minute break. So it's certainly not the normal format for an event like this, but we thought we would try it and see how it goes. Registered participants will be invited to provide feedback in the weeks following this event. And of course, I'd be particularly interested amongst other things in hearing what you thought of the format. If it works well, maybe we'll do it again the same way. And if it didn't work so well, we'll reconsider for next event. First, though, I just want to walk you through some of the tips we have for maximizing your experience today by adjusting some settings in Zoom. Hopefully you've downloaded the most recent version of Zoom. When you join the meeting, you should have been automatically muted and your camera should have been switched off. Please double check this and ensure that these settings remain in place. They're probably at the bottom left hand side of your screen, as you see here.
Now, if you hover over the square for someone whose camera is off, you'll see three dots. If you choose this, you can then choose non-video, uh, choose to hide non-video participants. Next, at the top right hand side of your screen, you should see a button called view. And if you choose this, you can then choose speaker view, which is what we recommend. Mm. If you exit full screen, if you happen to be on it, and open chat, you can then resize each window however you like and get the optimal view that works for you best. So when you registered, we asked what you would like us to call you. So for example, if you have your hand raised, and we need to say it's your turn. What would you, how would you like us to address you? So please ensure that your Zoom screen name is the name that we'd like you'd like us to use for you. And the way you can do this is by clicking on the three dots by your own name and choosing rename. For the questions and comments section, if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand by choosing reactions, should be along the bottom of your screen, and then raise your hand. We'd really love everyone to have the chance to speak, so do please bear this in mind when you're commenting and keep your comments relevant and concise. Um, if loads of people want to speak, we probably won't call on anybody more than once, um, and if there isn't that much going on, we may call on you another time. We'll see what happens. So just to reiterate, the presenters and the panelists will not respond immediately to your questions and comments, but your input will be used to inform the panel discussion at the end of the event. That's it. We really hope that today's presentations and discussion will be of use to all of you in addressing the macaque related issues you're dealing with whether you're attempting directly to implement a contraception program or you're concerned about an existing program and would like to know more. When you are given a feedback link in the coming few weeks by email, we'll also provide the opportunity to register your interest in a contraception subgroup. And if interest is sufficient, we'll take it from there. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Bye. Hello, uh, <clears throat> and a very good morning to everyone. Um, my name is uh, Sirjana Nijjar, and I am working with Federation of Indian Animal Protection Organizations, FIAPO, uh, in India as Director of Programs. And I am a lawyer, uh, and I have been working for the welfare of animals for past 15 years or so. And uh, I have worked with different organizations in India and uh, across um, other countries. Uh, and I am today joined uh, by my colleague, uh, Dr. Dinesh Moite, who is a senior veterinarian and uh, uh, working with FIAPO. And he also has a plethora of experience of working nationally and internationally. Uh, our today's presentation is about Indian macaque sterilization program and uh, the welfare implications and the ethical concerns. So uh, today we'll go through the major problems that we have uh, with human and monkey conflict. What are the efforts made to solve these issues. Uh, there are certain things regarding the sterilization program, some fact finding about these sterilization centers, uh, the impact of sterilization program, and uh, the limiting factors, and also the way forward. Okay, so to begin, uh, 
macaques have originated around 9 million years ago in Africa. And they have spread from Africa to Eurasia and then one, one lineage entered uh, Europe from there. And uh, that's why we see that they are the second largest population in primates after humans. And in India, there are four predominant macaque species that are present, which is a uh, bonnet macaque, rheus macaque, long-tailed macaque, and langur. So the rheus macaque species, they have the broadest geographical distribution. We see that they are spread throughout central to Southeast Asia, and they also cover a wide range of terrain, which is tropical rainforest. They are found in dry forest, in high altitudes, low altitudes. Uh, we also uh, find macaques in temperate mountains of Japan and China, uh, along with Nepal, Morocco, and in Sri Lanka, which is you know tropical rainforest in Asia, uh, India. So they have a wide geographical distribution. And with distribution uh, comes a great deal of human macaque conflicts as well. So if I talk about India, we have around 50 million monkey population in India. Uh, the problems and issues that we face is uh, human and animal conflicts. Uh, there are a lot of states that have uh, published data on damage to agricultural crops. Uh, from one of the states in India, we have received 7,000 complaints of monkeys and macaques damaging the crops. There are also issues around snatching food from public places. In India, you can find macaques around temples, tourist sites, railway stations, markets, also in residential colonies. And they enter homes and sometimes attack humans, not because they want to do it, but because they are forced to do it due to lack of resources. And we see that there is encroachment of forest land. There is large scale deforestation happening across the world, I would say. Also, there has been severe drought in uh, several places. In India, there uh, it alternates every year. Some years there would be drought, other years there would be floods. So we also see that is also one of the reasons for uh, animals entering human areas. Uh, another reason, separation of monkey groups. Uh, we also see loss of natural resources and urbanization as reasons for these problems. Uh, and these problems and the reasons create an impact which results in animals coming in the urban areas in search of food. Also, a lot of these animals are captured and killed in a very cruel manner when they enter human habitation, when they enter homes, or when they raid crops and uh, other human resources. Uh, certain times, there is also a conflict between uh, wild animals and the animals that live on streets in India. Uh, and that is specifically street dogs. We have also received several complaints and cases of monkeys um, that are attacked by street dogs as they compete for food in uh, you know the areas where there are food dumps or there is uh, no proper waste management. And uh, also uh, a lot of these animals, because uh, they are very averse to human, uh, they are not as friendly like, you know, dogs, and uh, often these animals suffer with no treatment. They remain injured and they suffer uh, miserably. 
due to all these conflicts. So uh, this is a photograph of um, langurs raiding a crop field. And uh, this is in one of the South Indian states. And uh, it was during the drought period that this has happened. I'm sorry, some of the photographs we share might be a little disturbing. So I'm just giving a previous warning. Uh, so these are some you know, issues that are there in urban areas. We often see that uh, monkeys, they follow or attack, you know, passerby if they have any food packet or even generally because they are afraid, they are wild animals and uh, they don't, uh, they, uh, they, there is a conflict in urban air settings. Um, this is deforestation. India, in India, a lot of hilly states. Uh, they are becoming urbanized and uh, a lot of tourist opportunities are there and the state governments see and, you know, want to uh, have more tourists, more revenue. And that has led to depletion of forest resources and forests and large scale uh, deforestation. Yeah, so some of the reasons and uh, this can be uh, quite disturbing. And we see the impact, monkeys coming into human places for water, for food. So this is uh, a very disturbing photo. Uh, this was a monkey in one of the Indian states that was continuously coming in human areas and, uh, you know, uh, taking food from a human habitation. This was bound and caged and kept in a very cruel way. In 2017, we also saw uh, in a lot of states in India, across India, that monkeys were beaten, uh, they were hanged, they were burned, they were poisoned. And uh, even in some of the states, traps are put in places where the cities are near uh, forests, uh, the people generally put traps around the boundary so that animals that come, try to come outside the forest to, into human habitation are trapped. And that has also been very distressing. We have received several complaints. We have also, a lot of our members have reported such issues. Um, Again, in one of the states, this is 2021, uh, 38 monkeys were poisoned, stuffed in gunny bags. Some of them were dead with poison, but some were still alive and they were beaten brutally and all of them died. Uh, you know, interestingly, India is a land of contrasts and uh, on one side, we see that uh, monkeys uh, are also, um, you know, uh, they are revered as gods. And we have a monkey god in Hindu mythology, in Hindu religion. Uh, on the other side, we see that there is a big conflict and people killing monkeys at this large scale. If I discuss, if I talk a little bit about the law in India, uh, we also see that the monkeys are protected under Indian Wildlife Protection Act. So the Wildlife Protection Act 1972, it protects all wild animals in India and monkeys are under Schedule 2 of that act, which means they have the highest protection. But that also means that if, they, if the population increases or the conflict increases, uh, this, the central government can declare them as vermin and they can be killed and, uh, you know, destroyed. And uh, sometimes there are uh, methods described or in other times they are just randomly killed, you know, using various methods. So uh, due to all these conflicts and by large scale killings, some of the states introduced sterilization programs. So the first one, after a huge farmer's protest, 
in one of the north indian hilly states himachal pradesh they were the first ones to start uh, a sterilization program in 2007 uh, they have experimented and they have called monkeys on a huge scale uh, himachal pradesh is a hilly state and has various orchards of apples and dry fruits and other fruits that are uh, that grow in colder climates so there is uh, there was a huge farmer protest because the monkeys were destroying these orchards uh initially the the farmers were poisoning the monkeys putting traps uh some of the orchards also kept uh you know dogs to uh, either kill the monkeys or drive them away uh monkeys were beaten uh there were shootings reported with use of air guns so you know looking at all that scenario and also uh large scale culling orders were given still they could not control the population and from uh you know there was also some pressure from the activist groups that is why the sterilization programs on the lines of animal birth control program for dogs that are run in various countries across uh the world and specifically you know southeast asian countries uh india has a huge sterilization program for dogs so on those lines uh, a sterilization program was started another north indian state uttarakhand the forest department has been undertaking sterilization program to control the population and they have claimed a 25% decrease in the population of monkeys and 31% decline in langur population then you know learning from these two states in 2018 a south indian state telangana uh, they had a huge monkey uh, human and human and monkey conflict so they started this first rescue sterilization and release program in 2022 we also see in karnataka forest department they have they have started decided to start this sterilization program and uh, they are building the facility to do it yes so sterilization program management if we look at it uh, in himachal and karnataka which are two states they are doing catch sterilization and release method um another south indian state telangana they are doing rescue sterilization rehabilitation generally adult female monkeys they are sterilized using laparoscopic method and the males undergo vasectomy uh the veterinary staff are performed to do the sterilization procedures and uh, most of them are trained in himachal pradesh which was the first state to start this program so some of the you know undercover fact finding um uh, that has been done by people for animals and peta india teams in 2015 uh, the team from animal welfare board of india veterinary university representative from the veterinary university people for animals india and peta's in peta india they have inspected a facility in shimla which is the capital of himachal pradesh state and they found some very disturbing issues there the monkeys and sterilization at the sterilization centers were captured by untrained individuals who had no idea on how the monkeys need to be handled and how they need to be caught so this was done in a very random way a lot of animals were getting injured and you know they had very traumatic experience during these captures and uh, even when they were brought to the facility they were not given any treatment there have been tail injuries face injuries uh broken bones and you know many such other things that have resulted only from the way they were 
caught by the untrained people. Um, also, uh, after the sterilization, the other wounds were not looked at before release and the animals were released in the wild. Uh, the facility also did not have any ultrasound machine. So they were any female monkeys, even if they were pregnant, they were uh, only, you know, the doctors were able to find out during the surgery and there was no proper anesthetic use used. And uh, these were some of the issues that were found, but we don't know how many other issues might be present. We don't know how the, these animals were kept. And I would also mention here that for dogs, we have animal birth control rules under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, which protects all animals across India and cruelties on all, all, on all animals. But if we see, we do not have any rules for monkey sterilization. The rules for dogs are very specific to dogs. They define how the dog, uh, dog sterilization program has to be run, how the, uh, how the animals need to be captured, what should be the facility, uh, how they need to be released, how they need to be tagged, everything. So those are detailed rules for dog birth control program. Uh, but if we, you know, compare those uh, with, the, the, those cannot be applied to monkey situations. Uh, and we don't have any rules or any record keeping for these uh, monkey sterilization programs that are going on. So what, what was the impact of these programs? So... Himachal Pradesh Forest Department claims to have uh, claims to sterilize uh, 140,000, more than 140,000 uh, monkeys. And they have also claimed that the monkey population has been stabilizing. Um, personally speaking, uh, I might disagree with that that this sterilization has caused stabilization because we still receive lots of complaints from the local locals there um, about the monkey and human conflict and uh, destruction of crops. A uh, lot of activist complaints of uh, monkeys getting killed in urban areas, you know, uh, poisoning people, keeping poison food uh, on their rooftops. And we also receive, you know, several other cruelty complaints, trapping of monkeys, especially around the uh, forest areas. Um, also, uh, one of the scientists, uh, Mr. Satish Gupta, uh, he has claimed that the results of this program are inconclusive. So we don't know exactly, you know, the government uh, claiming that the stabilizing monkey population is due to the sterilization programs that uh, we, we cannot claim that uh, conclusively because there has the, still the large scale killings are going on and uh, there are several times when monkeys are declared vermin and then large scale cullings continue with, with a legal license of course. Um, in the capital of India, Delhi, uh, the government, uh, the government of Delhi wanted to start the sterilization program because uh, the capital also has a lot of green cover and uh, there is a protected area inside uh, the capital uh, and Delhi is the greenest capital uh, in the world. So we have forest areas inside the capital that are protected and there is some wild population of monkeys there and uh, they often come and sit on the roads on the pavements and people feed them. So we also see you know that kind of feeding uh, going on in those areas uh, because in Delhi most of the forest the forest protected areas uh, also do not have fruit bearing trees and uh, the reason again is even if the food bearing trees are planted due to the pop, uh, due, to, due to the pollution they don't give any fruits so we have seen you know even this uh, side of that uh, scenario that 
even when trees are planted, either they don't survive and the fruit trees often they are very sensitive and due to pollution, they don't have any fruits. So monkeys do come on the roads and, uh, you know, enter the urban, urban settings, sit on the roads across, um, you know, the traffic areas even. So uh, the government wanted to undertake this sterilization program, uh, but due to a lot of, um, you know, activist pressure, animal activists opposed this uh, move and uh, filed a petition in the court and, you know, stopped this program of sterilization in the capital of India. Uh, the plan to use this immunocontraceptive vac uh, vaccine, uh, this is also off the table now because everything related to monkeys has been totally stopped in the, the capital of Delhi, capital of India, which is Delhi. Uh, we also see that a lot of uh, monkeys are captured and they are released on the peripheries outside uh, the capital and there is some forest, uh, reserved forests there. Um, the monkeys are captured from inside the cities and released there. Um, but again, uh, you know, those forests, again, they don't have any fruit bearing or any source of food. So we also see that generally uh, people go and feed monkeys there. I can't see. Um, can any can everyone see the presentation? No, uh, it looks as though it, it's just you now. Your presentation has oh. disappeared. Do you want to try sharing screen again? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's it's come back now. Yes, just a second. Um, okay. Yes. So um, I was just speaking about the capture of uh, monkeys in the capital of India and you know releasing them to the wild where people go and feed them so that they don't enter again, you know, the city areas. And um, the wildlife department, because this is, this seems like a short term measure. It is not a measure that can go on for a long time, capturing of monkeys from city and, you know, uh, putting them in um, the, on the peripheries of the city. There are always chances of them coming back. Uh, so the wildlife department is now uh, proposing to conduct a wildlife census by employing the local authorities, civic bodies, and also train monkey catchers. And how to train them, uh, how to catch the monkeys ethically and you know how to capture them in troops. So this is what the department is trying to do now. Dr. Dinesh, can you move the slide? Okay. Otherwise. So, uh, but there are certain limiting factors that affect these sterilization programs. Um, a lot of things have been overlooked and even program seems like a uh, you know, quick way or quick step uh, on the lines of dog control, uh, dog birth control program. And uh, it seems like a lot of thought was not put into this. It was just used as a method to pacify people and the farmers. Um, so some of the factors that limit these programs. It does not it, it may not yield desired results as the alpha male when it, it is captured it is replaced by another uh, another male of the group and then the group continues to reproduce um another issue is that the 
monkeys they learn behavior very quickly you often say you know imitation people imitating like monkey so a uh, monkey will very easily understand the groups very quickly learn that who is coming to catch them and uh, we have even seen that kind of behavior in dogs they always recognize the vehicle and you know the people with the nets so same is there with monkeys uh, the monkeys they become very aggressive to, towards humans so this i think is uh, one of the issues that might come again this is not a successful or you know proven method there have been lot of studies in case of uh, dog sterilization across the world control of rabies through vaccination and sterilization but this has not been uh, proven in the wild so this sterilization of wild monkeys we don't know uh, you know if it will control the population or what kind of effects it will have i see more cruelty happening uh, with the sterilization of wild populations um there is also a need for training on ethical catching of monkeys also we see that uh, one of the major factors limiting the program is that uh, the monkey population it has learned and you know it has the ability to adapt to newer environments they are very much like humans uh you know like humans can live in a wide range of environments and weather conditions and terrains uh the even after you know sterilization and such huge scale killings across the world and in india i would say specifically uh we still see that uh the population is not decreasing to that extent so we, we see that the reason the only reason is because they have the ability to adapt to newer environments to adapt to newer habitats and to survive coexistence and uh, macaque behavior we see that uh why is there a sudden crease i mean this is a question to ponder that why we see this sudden increase in aggression uh among the macaques of india uh see generally speaking no wild animal wants to come in a conflict with the humans they are afraid more afraid uh to you know uh, come in contact with humans then we are afraid of them they are harmless and you know peaceful species in wild if they have proper uh, habitat to Uh, for themselves they would never want to come in human habitation they live in you know troops consisting of infants there are sub adults elderly uh, sexually mature male adults so we see also that there is extremely strong bond mother infant bond in macaques and uh, because of that and you know breaking of that bond during the sterilization program capturing in a violent ma uh, manner all these uh, uh, you know the human intervention has led to this sudden aggression and we see that there are uh, so many attacks on humans um, the conflict is increasing and uh, just very recently 3 or 4 days back uh we have report from uh, one of the tourist famous tourist places taj mahal where a monkey has uh bitten a swiss tourist so i think uh you know we have to understand their natural instinct there is a need to understand their natural behavior and maybe then strategize on how to deal with this conflict because definitely the current situation and the current handling of this issue is not helped some of the suggestions or you know i would say the way forward because we don't have answers for everything uh, at fiapo um the first thing is you know understanding monkey behavior which is critical to to you know for for any program for any sterilization program or uh, to control the population or to reduce the conflict 
I think uh, there has been a total disregard of this aspect and quick fixes have been formulated in order to pacify a certain uh, population uh, in India, I would say. Uh, we also have to ensure that there is availability of food in the forest. There have to be you know, massive plantation drives, fruit trees, flowering plants. If we are able to do that, we can reduce the conflict considerably. Uh, there has to be capacity building around humane catching and handling of monkeys. Uh, public awareness and behavior around a wild animal is very important because we often see people teasing the animals and uh, monkey, you know, being quick learners, uh, they will see every other human as a threat if they are teased or if they are, if the group is uh, attacked by one person. So every person, uh, will become the target of the aggression. Uh, I think waste management is extremely important. Uh, if we can, if the governments can manage the urban waste and food waste, uh, that will considerably reduce the conflict. Uh, another, for India specifically, um, we would like to explore the immunosterilization, you know, either by vaccination or even oral contraception. And, uh, but we don't know the long-term effects of these things on, uh, on wild monkey population. Um, the issue again, you know, is knowing the census and, uh, we feel that it has, it, it, it has to be done systematically. Uh, whether it is uh, sterilization or it is uh, giving oral contraception, uh, you know, randomly doing it without a strategy and a census and an understanding of behavior and the dynamics uh, will not give results. So uh, we want to explore those options and uh, we are looking forward to other speakers and their suggestions and the success stories um, that are there across the world to control the population in a humane manner. And uh, we are very much looking forward to uh, inputs on these issues uh, on, of, for India. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really interesting. Um, You've finished exactly at the scheduled time, which is very impressive. <laughs> I don't know how you manage that. <laughs> um, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Um, yeah, it sounds like it's a really, really complex issue with so many different facets that need to be considered in a really cohesive way. And you have a challenge ahead of you, <laughs> for sure. But what I do hope is that the next couple of presentations might, um, uh, they're not going to completely solve your problems, but they're going to at least offer some insights into various aspects of, of what you're facing. Um, so thank you very much. And we'll see you and Dinesh at the, ses at the panel session at the end of the day or at the end of this event. So thank you. <laughs> Um, I want to now ask Paolo to come on. Um, Paolo is from the Ocean Park Conservation Foundation in Hong Kong and uh, has been running a really quite good program for uh, contraception for some years now. So take it away. All right, thank you very much for having <laughs> us. Um, I will be presenting on behalf of uh, Carty, Alex and uh, Kelly, who are my uh, colleagues on these programs and with the uh, Ocean Park Conservation Foundation. And uh, we work in uh, close collaboration and actually on behalf of the AFCD, that's the uh, Conservation Department uh, Agency of the Hong Kong government. So we have been uh, doing a contraception program uh, in uh, in Hong Kong for a while now. So for, for those of you who don't know Hong Kong, 
Uh, you may have seen it in the movies. It's a lot of buildings and there's all kinds of apes jumping from building to buildings. But there's also some monkeys jumping around and um, they are actually a bit misrepresented in the in the scene uh, in the movies uh, hong kong is very green uh, territory 70 percent of the territory is actually green with good um, connection between green areas and 40 percent of it is protected so there are some very beautiful areas uh, including some bordering villages and uh, rural settlements and obviously there's a lot of room for wildlife uh, in such an environment. The uh, monkeys themselves are localized more in one area and our programs are carried out exclusively uh, in those areas that are circled on the map. Not much point in telling you the names of areas you, you don't know, but uh, the population uh, programs are, are run there and most of the population is uh, in, in that uh, space. You can see them uh, enjoying the uh, facilities uh, available in the protected area. Clearly, those natural areas are also accessible to people. Um, there's about 7 point uh, something million people living in Hong Kong, a lot increasingly. And uh, the macaques have been around, but they actually, uh, to give a quick overview of the history of macaques, uh, they were around, the resource is within the resource distribution. Then they were eradicated, and uh, in the early 1900s, uh, rhesus macaques were reintroduced. And then after the Second World War, some long-tailed macaques were released as well. And then over the years, a couple of other species escaped here and there and joined the, joined the wild ones. Short, uh, long story short, uh, 60 years later, there's been a lot of crossbreeding, interbreeding, back crosses and so forth. And now we have what we call the Hong Kong macaques, which is essentially a cross between the rhesus and the long tail. Some are distinctly rhesus. You can see there on the left, the two pictures, the lots of rhesus features. Some are more uh, typically long tails. Uh, these are also taken in, in Hong Kong. And uh, others, the two bottom pictures, you can see there's a mix. It's, it's hard to tell uh, exactly what they are. Well, they're the Hong Kong macaque and it's, uh, it's a composition. They occupy the niche like any other macaque would. We currently keep tracks of 32 troops. Um, some we call common troops, others we call elusive troops based on how easily, uh, how frequently they are sighted. Some are very large, some are much smaller, and uh, they are all given uh, names uh, by different surveyors over the years. And some of the individuals are also given uh, names, uh, some for obvious reasons, the guy on the left. And the uh, little one on the right is a young boy who suffered the loss of an arm when he was a young boy, but he grew up to be a very successful leader. He has his own troop now, so he was named after a local hero, mythological hero. Yes. So in uh, in Hong Kong, uh, the macaques breed, uh, we have distinct seasons, so it's, it's kind of an advantage for our programs because it means that most of the birth are uh, concentrated at one period of the year. Uh, the peak birth is July, August, and the first uh, birth will be sometime in April, the last sometime in September. Uh, they breed quite young because of the good food provisioning and uh, lack of challenges overall so we sometimes have animals as young as five year old who are already giving birth to uh, their first infant the mortality overall is unknown you'll see that uh, in most studies it's very hard to determine mort natural mortality rates for wild uh, populations the infant mortality is easier to establish and ours seems to be comparable to others that have been studied so about 20 30 percent of the infants uh, shouldn't make it past the first year and the, while the population of the humans continues to increase, the population of macaques seem to be static, perhaps decreasing, uh, whether it is, it's, it's not on a wild uh, rate of increase. The relationship between people and uh, monkeys, uh, as uh, you've seen from other presentation, is, is complicated. Occasionally, you have some very strong and intimate bonds, like in, in one, this is one of our oldest feeders, uh, finally, finally, recently retired stop feeding the monkeys but for decades she's been going around she knows them well and so forth unfortunately it's not always so innocuous as a sweet old lady feeding some friendly monkeys often is uh, 
people going to the country park. You can see this on a daily basis. They go to a country park, they feed, they bring a lot of food that they leave behind that really just becomes garbage for us, food for the animals. And uh, they can be quite cranky individuals. They, they have been very unpleasant to our own staff and so forth. So th this unfortunately creates a situation where the animals learn to associate people with food and they learn that if they ask food forcefully, they will get food. So they become aggressive. So we, we teach them all bad behaviors and then they might extend to areas outside the country parks. And you can see here on, on this picture here on the left, the, the monkey commando going up uh, a uh, housing estate, entering people's homes and so forth. So that is obviously clearly uh, unacceptable behavior uh, by, by human standards for, for monkeys just foraging in. So, and really is often because of poor waste management, which of course the monkey thinks is great waste management because it's easily accessible food. High quality food, palatable, full of fats and sugars, much easier than, than looking for a bitter leaf in the, in the forest. And whatever the reason for that, this supplemental provisioning is causing the population uh, fecundity to be at its maximum. So the potential for breeding is excellent and the chances for the population to then spread beyond its natural or reasonable uh, area of distribution is, uh, is pushed beyond the limits. This means that you need to put in place some form of macaque management plan. And uh, in 99, uh, the government took this uh, seriously and they started a few things. And there are different facets to it. One is a, a nuisance team, so to handle complaints and to be able to intervene when there were people uh, pointing out that some problem monkeys were present. Another one was on the legislative side to issue a feeding ban. So the, it, was, it became illegal to feed monkeys in the country parts. They're extending it now to the whole territory. There's also been an initiative to plant trees. This is a PR measure. Uh, the monkeys uh, are not coming out because they're running out of food. They're coming out because the food is easily available and uh, people invite them by bringing food to them. They create the conflict and then it becomes the easy provisioning. Whatever it is, it's a, it's a palatable measure for the public and it's, uh, it, there's nothing wrong with adding trees to the forest. So. I'm not sure who's singing there. And uh, then there's also a contraceptive component to the program. And the contraceptive component is what, what we're most involved in. And that is really birth control. So we have to be clear of the purpose of birth control. The purpose of birth control is to reduce fecundity, means the potential to breed, thereby reducing fertility, means the output of new babies. And therefore the population size should decrease as soon as the natural mortality rate is higher than the current birth rate. There are no migration of uh, new monkeys in Hong Kong, so that side of recruitment is not an option. When you've done that, however successfully, you haven't changed the behavior of the monkey. So you, you, we don't expect because a, a monkey breed, stops breathing that it will stop stealing or they will stop considering dustbins as a source of food or they will consider a plastic bag uh, carried around as a potential target for uh, attacks. So that we have to be very clear on. It's not uh, it's not the object of birth control. Uh, birth control is obviously a lot more ethical and also more palatable than culling or than short-term uh, operations. Uh, and so it's more sustainable. When you want to implement a program, you're looking at the long term and you need to find something that has good chance of being sustained, not something that you start up too many objections, you stop and then 10 years go by, people debating and so forth. So for females, a uh, number of things have been tried. Immunocontraception didn't work. Uh, I, our recommendation now is don't waste your time with immunocontraception in wild uh, macaques. There's this very simple and true a statement made by others that says the contraception is most effective in long-lived species if it is a long-lasting method and if it's applied to a large proportion of females. It's obvious, it's true. Uh, if it's a permanent measure, it's definitely long-lasting and uh, macaques are long-living. So it sounds like this is the way to go. So focusing on the females initially makes the most sense also if you have limited resources focus on sterilizing females because females give birth. 
Um, so I, I can't share too much detail on the immune contraception for some legal reasons, but just let, enough to say that we stopped doing it because it's just not working. Contraception of males, uh, we used to do a chemical vasectomy. We also stopped because when we started checking the vas deference of the individual animals, we found that about 50% of the vas deference were still containing spermatozoans. So technically we could have had 100% failure since there's two vas deference per animal. And we stopped doing that and we also moved to endoscopic vasectomy. Mm. Important when you choose a method for males, we think is to choose a method that does not risk increasing the survival of the males. Males have a hard time in the wild and you can see from the composition of the demographics in uh, macaques that there are far less males surviving to adult age than there are females surviving to adult age. Uh, the birth is one to one, adults is one to seven. So, it is important to not, cast, uh, we think, to not castrate the animal because it might just make their life easier and, and extend their life, uh, their lifespan, which defeats the purpose. Before 2009, the program was resting on uh, non-surgical methods, so immunocontraception and chemical vasectomy. And this is the population change. It's not entirely fair to blame that on ineffective uh, contraception because that's also the time when people started counting the macaques. So to be fair, uh, they were increasing numbers because we we're counting more. Uh, in 2009, when we started using the surgical methods, you can see the population seems to have uh, plateaued there and there's quite a sharp uh, change. So we, we think that uh, speaks uh, in itself. And here I'll give you some uh, details on uh, how we run the uh, programs. The um, starts with daily service where people going out um, every day, they're, they're attending this meeting. You can ask them questions afterwards. Uh, we habituate them to mass traps and then we catch them all together and then we catch the individuals from the mass capture and then we anesthetize them one at a time. We do the triage and processing and then we release them and we insist many, many times and very strongly release the same day on the same site and then we continue monitoring uh, after that. So some uh, further details on that. The surveys are an essential component of the contraceptive program. We use food calls to attract the macaques and we, and we run these surveys around the trapping areas. Our study is not a ecological survey, it's a, a program for contraception. So whatever we do is still aimed at capturing and um, contracepting animals. So the surveys are done around the trapping sites where we habituate them. And it's really, really important to develop the relationship between surveyors and uh, the macaques. These pictures explains very well why, because you can see these are trap mass trapping cages many years after having been using this cage. And you can see the macaques are still very keen to go in and see what's in there and so forth. Actually, in a case like that, we would have to wait for some animals to come out before trapping because it's, it's a bit too many. The, after we catch the, the animals, then we set up around it and we use basic equipment, tents, picnic uh, tables and so forth. And uh, we rely on a core group of people and volunteers. And then we have a cage, the trapping cage has a moving partition. So the, the people and the monkeys are always separate by a uh, grid. That means that the animals never have the fear that they'll get caught. They just move away from a partition into these smaller cages here that are also squeeze cage. They get injected, they fall asleep in there and they never have to be uh, feeling like they're being grabbed uh, by a super predator. And um, then they go to a triage station. We check, are they recaptured animals? Are they pregnant? Do they have uh, other underlying problems? They may exclude them from surgery. We take some basic uh, measurements. We vaccinate them against rabies and a few things like this. And then they move on to the surgical station where we do an endoscopic surgery. We try to process eight to 10 animals an hour. That, that's our target. Uh, and... Uh, the procedure is fairly straightforward. I think we don't need to go into the details here and many of you are familiar with it. Uh, we've developed techniques where boys and girls, uh, male and female can be sterilized using the same equipment, the same setup, the same position. So for the surgeons, they can just keep going 
uh, one after the other without worrying if it's a female or male changing instruments and so forth. Keeps it more efficient. Uh, here on the top left is a, a vast deference that's about to be uh, cauterized. And here on the right is a typical female macaque uh, anatomy, internal anatomy. And you can see here the tube is what we would be resecting. Complications so far, uh, none. It's a very simple procedure that's very safe. So we, we haven't had surgical complications uh, to date. And contraindications, meaning what would prevent an animal from getting to the table, um, advanced pregnancy. Uh, technically, you could do pregnant animals. It's not a problem. The, it just takes a lot longer and we're not in the business of stopping all population from existing. So if we let a, a pregnant female get out, it's okay. She'll give birth. Next time we catch her, we'll sterilize her. But also, um, it doesn't slow down the operations. And then if the animals have very severe peritoneal adhesions or hernias, sometimes it delays the, the, the procedure. Uh, these are contraindications that are seldom uh, encountered though, uh, over the last, I don't know, thousands and thousands of surgeries, maybe a handful only. Uh, the wounds are very small, so they can be just glued shut. And you can see it leaves barely a scar. So I'm not sure what the circle is showing, but I assume there was a scar there before when we took the picture. And then the animals are identified individually. They're all given a tattoo that represents the troop they were caught uh, from. You notice here this fellow on the right has a B under the sign, the sign for crazy gold, because the, we've been doing this for 12 years. So obviously nothing stays the same, including uh, macaque uh, social societies. So this crazy gold is split into other splinter groups. And now we have to add the name of splinter group. And that helps us recognize which macaques have been done and, and so forth. Then we release them the same day. Like I said, I'll insist again. I think it's very important to release the animal from at the other site where we, it was caught and on the same day. And I'll give you a few more details on how we release uh, afterwards. But a uh, quick over, uh, overview of the results, 2008 and nine, we were starting at about 59 to 60% fertility, which is the natural rate. So this is almost 10 years after doing immunocontraception. The birth rate was the same as a natural population. So if you need further proof that you shouldn't probably shouldn't waste your time exploring that. My advice and how the people have different opinion, but from the numbers. And then you can see here, there's a sharp decline and now we seem to have uh, reached a point of diminishing returns and we're kind of uh, struggling to stay below half the natural uh, recruitment rate. So back to the management plan, the contraceptive program is a very narrow focus and a very narrow aspect of a macaque management plan. It is not a silver bullet. Ooh, macaques are attacking my uh, stuff on the way back from the supermarket. I will sterilize them. That's not expected to give a change in behavior. It's expected to give a change in fertility. This is really, really cannot be repeated often enough. Um, the uh, important thing is, in, when it comes to conflict is the amount of um, reports, nuisance reports, complaints. And you can see here the drop in complaints. We, once the program started, you saw in 99, they started conceiving it took a few years to to get it right and then you can see the the drop and uh, it's become now less than a quarter of what it was when they started so in that sense it's definitely a success from uh, from a government the performance point of view so some points that maybe we can throw out there that can be used later in the uh, discussion uh, panels uh, one is that what we've learned over the years, over the last 12 years of, uh, of doing this, is that we had to find the right time of year and the right number of captures to be most efficient. And uh, we stopped catching animals during the peak season uh, for birth because we would spend a lot of time and resources catching animals that were pregnant and couldn't come to for surgery. So we're just catching them, anesthetizing them, submitting to submitting the animals and the staff to heat stress, is the, the heat of the summer. 
and then at the end of all that nothing was done so there, there's clearly a welfare issue for staff and animals there and uh, in terms of resource utilization it's irrational uh, we modified the trapping cages you saw that moving partition that was a gigantic step in in terms of uh, welfare because you remove the the fear of being caught or being grabbed uh, from the the elements and then the animals are habituated to cages many have been caught several times so they give the cue to the others it's a fairly uh, relaxed uh, atmosphere inside the traps now and then we become better at finding at attracting the, the target groups you know maybe some groups we've only sterilized 20 percent, so we want to focus on those first and then make sure that if you have traps uh, mass traps or individual traps those should never be left unattended it's a big no-no to put a trap and not uh, being able to intervene and be present immediately once the animal are, are caught. Uh, the other thing we've learned how to have an efficient flow, you know, you, you can only be as fast as your slowest step. So it doesn't matter how fast your surgeons are, if everything else is slow out there, it doesn't help and, and vice versa. And for all, every step is important. Uh, we now release moms with very young babies if they have infants we put them in a in a separate cage for the release we still release them uh, together with the others but from a smaller cage so that the mother keeps holding on to the baby and uh, we're sure that they go out together the males sometimes when they wake up the big boys tend to be a bit cranky and uh, they might uh, be a bit violent to the other animals so we also uh, put them in individual cages and release them separately we don't allow them in the large troop uh, in the large uh, mass capture cage and uh, going around bullying others. Also, when you release, we have to make sure that other troops have not arrived and are going to challenge the one we release. Otherwise, we're starting a fight uh, between troops. And we, again, insist, release the same day at the capture site. Don't listen to anyone telling you otherwise. That's, that's my strong opinion. And then make sure that you are diligent with your service. So see what's, what's happening after you release them and go back and see them and so forth. The uh, social impact assessment on the animals. Um, this is something we've uh, looked at a little bit. Obviously 12 years of observation, uh, it, it counts for something, but we've also tried to put them together. One of our surveyor has uh, done her masters on that. Maybe she can share more later. Uh, it seems that the monkeys in groups that are, have been sterilized more spend more time grooming and that, that's about it. So, so far we haven't seen any negative impact uh, of the, uh, of the mass sterilization for, for groups that have most of their females sterilized. We're also doing a population viability study. It's ongoing now, so I, I can't tell you what the findings are because it's ongoing. But basically is to uh, give us advice on, on uh, how we should continue uh, going forward. Should we increase the intensity of the capture and, and or should we decrease it or should we keep it as it is now and try to put some modeling uh, on that. The other thing we've really learned is that it's, it's essential and it's, it's a absolute uh, prerequisite to have good relationships with the people you need uh, for the for the program to be a success so all the stakeholders and make sure you're actually talking about stakeholders so people with a stake in it not just people with a loud voice and an opinion you both have a stake in the problem should be the ones that you, you listen to and then also be adaptive uh, things change you know over 12 or oh, it's a long-term program you don't expect things to remain the same and, and you have to be able to adapt to the situation and not try to constrain uh, reality into your own ideas um, if you look at the composition of the population uh, from 2012 till now, so let's say the last 10 years, the proportion of adults has uh, increased, obviously, because there's less recruitment. We're not seeing a big tapering off in the overall population because it's only been 12 years. So may, many of the animals we're doing are, are expected to be still alive in their natural lifespan. Uh, there may be a drop later. It's one of the reasons why we want to have a bit of modeling around that. And um, I think um, another important thing is, uh, as the previous speaker was saying, their results and then their intended results. So it, uh, is what the results you're getting what you were hoping for or what you were expecting so in terms of public complaints yes we, we, we're satisfied the the public knows that there's there are programs in place 
and they they know that we're, we're trying our best to deal with things ethically so that that is uh, has gone the right way the birth rate has reduced it is half what it was um, the public support has increased both public and government support has increased the the public um is uh, appreciative of the efforts to do this without uh, harming the animals and the government continues to issue uh, contracts to to do it this way um the macaque population is secure we're, we're not looking at getting rid of macaques we're just trying to get rid of conflict uh, with macaques and one thing that didn't quite go that way is that people are so excited about the program that they forget that all these things they have a part to play in and uh, we have to find ways to 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 change that we're doing that also now through uh, insisting on values and on, on using behavior change tools to try to make people understand what their responsibility what their roles are in, in all of this it's inevitable the species that share the same environment like in this picture will interact sometimes it's nice sometimes it's not but it's inevitable and uh, if you hate that species, one is too many. If you love the species, numbers don't matter. So it's really not just a numbers uh, game. It's, it's a values uh, game. And um, also understand that you're in it for a long term. So when you're dealing with the press or politicians or the public, they can do things like that, you know, send a tweet, send a note, call a friend in government, make a complaint. It takes a second to do that. But to implement a program, to see a result, to, to see a baby not being born, this takes years. So you have to understand that the times don't concord there. And, and you have to, that's why you need good relationships with stakeholders, because they're fairly complicated things to, to explain and to, to work with. Uh, but it is possible, and you know, on, on this picture it shows, this is one of our surveyors who took a rest on a hot day and the monkeys that know her came to interact, almost like that. And um, I think this is all I have for you. It should be within time. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I will stop sharing the screen now. Okay, it's 35 minutes past the hour or five minutes past the hour. And um, we're ready to go ahead with the next presentation, um, which has to do with um, the social effects of sterilization on wild macaque groups in Bali. And it, we have Fanny and Gwenin. And, uh, Fanny is starting out. And over to you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you just fine, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Brooke, for the invitation. Uh, hello to everyone. So yeah, my name is Fanny. Uh, I'm very happy to, to be here today. And uh, thank you to previous speakers um, for the very great presentations they, they gave. So, um, Gwenan and I will present you today a study case, a very at very local scale, uh, of birth control in urban long-tailed macaque uh, in Bali, in Indonesia. So I I will start with some um, you know basic some uh, with a global picture, if I may. So as you know, more than. Uh, 300 percent of primate species live in anthropogenic habitats today, which are quite diversified, including secondary forest, urban and rural landscape, temple and touristic sites. So it's actually a um, global and widespread phenomenon, primates living in anthropogenic habitats. A talk it further concerns generalist uh, primate species. So Primates' response to human disturbance are diversified, going from uh, local, sometimes extinction, to sometimes growth of population. And even sometimes in urban settings, we experience kind of overpopulations, which is quite difficult to define. So we will further talk about uh, high uh, density, high demographic density. So this leads to um, an intensification of uh, the conflict uh, with, uh, with humans. And um, 
this uh, scenario of high density in urban settings requires specific management measures, as we have seen uh, before. However, it is crucial to emphasize that uh, successful colonization at local scale does not mean long-term survival at the global scale. So as regard to the long-tailed macaque, uh, you probably all know that the IUCN status has recently been uh, reassessed uh, as endangered. Uh, and this thanks to the hard work of the Long-Tailed Market Project collaborators uh, led by Malin. So the management measures um, at a local scale should target conflict mitigation to promote coexistence. Uh, while also carefully assess and, and limit the risks of these management measures. I think it's a very important message. So very briefly, the implications of um, high local density situations in, or in urban settings concerns the multiplication of conflicts as we have seen. Uh, but also um, an increase, uh, a, a, a deterioration of the living conditions for the primates who live in high density, uh, including a, an increased social tension within groups and between groups at this site. So the different, the most common measures used to control demographics across the primate range are culling, uh, translocation, and more recently birth control. But note also that regular feeding and um, I mean the regulation of uh, food provisioning, uh, as we have seen in, in Hong Kong, uh, for instance, and the managing of food access is a very crucial strategy in any case. So uh, let's focus on the birth control first. Uh, so it's increasingly used, but we still have very few monitoring data available so far. I think it's the goal of the of the workshop today to, to summarize uh, all the information we have. So the efficiency of implications of such program require clearly a careful examination and hopefully the workshop will help will be very helpful to gather information in, in that in that sense. So uh, the choice of the method used to control demographics, in my opinion, of course, relies on several requirements uh, before implementation. So first, we need basic knowledge of the population, uh, local or global population, including demographics, of course, and the cause of the conflict, because it's not always related to the number of monkeys. So. Uh, a good knowledge will allow us to define a clear objective and assess the efficiency of the strategy using demographical, behavioral, and social assessment. So obviously, the choice of the method must, must be based on the biology of the target species, including the reproduction patterns, the social and organization, the social organization and structure, and the conservation status. And finally, um, there is no one uh, set, one unique solution. Each situation is very specific depending on the culture and the socio, uh, socioeconomic context and means. So regarding the re reproduction of birth control, the first fact is that among the different techniques, the different chemical and surgical nurturing techniques used with primates, it's today quite recognized that uh, targeting only males is useless uh, for many cercopithecine species, which, which have a polygamous mating system and male migration. So indeed, any intact male can virtually fertilize every female of the group. So female must be the priority target for sterilization to curb, to hope curbing population growth. And second fact, um, a talk chemical contraception are recommended given the re uh, reversibility nature um, of this approach. It's, it's often not feasible with free ranging primates because it requires several um, captures. So in turn, the surgery, um, especially tubectomy for females, require a single capture for permanent sterility. 
And moreover, instead of ovariectomy, so gonadectomy, the tubectomy preserves the ovarian function and the sexual steroid hormone secretions, which are involved in sexual behaviors that, that allow to maintain a natural um, primate behavior and natural sexual activity. So yet, yeah, there are still pending questions related to tubectomy with free-ranging primates. The first one concerns the socio-behavioral and welfare implications. So we actually have very few published data on the potential impact on the behavior and on the social dynamics of both the new sterile, uh, st sterile status of the females and the long-term absence of new offspring for the treated females. But I will leave this question, this part to Gwenan, who will present her results on the behavioral aspects. So for my side, I will focus on the second pending question, which is the efficacy of uh, any tubectomy program to actually control populace, population growth. We have seen a very good example with the Hong Kong program uh, presented by Paolo. But to be effective, a significant proportion of females have to be sterilized. And that requires regular and strong effort uh, on the long term. So it's definitely a long term solution uh, with regular efforts. And this also requires the demogra demographic modeling to define the objective before the intervention and to assess the efficacy of the, of the measures over the long term. So these are both crucial information to support the management decision. Okay, so we present now um, our study case. So um, we work in, in Bali, which, which is, um, an, as you know, an island of Indonesia with a high anthropogenic uh, landscape uh, and many monkey forests, which are actually um, touristic sites or sanctuary. So we spe specifically work in Ubud monkey forest, so which is a, um, a touristic and a religious sanctuary with it is characterized by intense human macaque contacts and it's located in central Bali. So this sanctuary shelters a native population of uh, long-tailed macaques with more than 1,000 monkeys, which lives uh, in a quite small forest fragment of 16 hectares. So this uh, high density has led the community stakeholders to implement a birth control program uh, with, with her, her help and successive campaigns have been done uh, during the last years. So I will present you today um, this program. Um, first, here you have, you can see the demographic trends of the population, of this specific population of Ubud uh, until 2017. So you can see on the graph, the gray bar uh, represents the abundance of the monkeys, so the population size. Uh, over the last 30 years, and they have experienced, this population experienced uh, a very high demographic growth, despite several epidemic outbreaks. Okay, so the mean annual growth rate is about 10%. So with a such density, the site is um, characterized as overpopulated, and, and also uh, by a growing conflict with humans. So we also have an increasing number of complaints from uh, neighbors and, and from tourists visiting the site. We also notice due to this um, increased growth, um, efficient dynamics of the groups. So you can see here on the left map in 2012, we had five groups. We, you have the home ranges uh, represented uh, on the map. And in 2021, and still today, we have 10 groups. So we have a multiplication efficient of the groups, plus the monkeys um, extend their range increasingly outside the sanctuary. Of course, there is a competition for space. Uh, so that increase um, the, the, the nuisances and the problems with, uh, with people living around. So following the request of the stakeholders, we discussed with them the different uh, strategy that could be implemented to curb the population growth. Culling and translocation have been, uh, were excluded for obvious ethical and cultural reasons. Uh, controlling food provisioning has been uh, discussed and, and tried to be implemented, but it's not so easy than uh, in, in Hong Kong. 
and uh, also, of course, the um, birth control have been selected uh, to try to curb population growth. But the objective we had was to stabilize the population. So we we define a clear objective of a null growth rate. We do not uh, want a decline. We just want to stop the growth. Um, and to do that, we used um, uh, population viability analysis. So to reach this objective, we modeled how many females should be sterilized. Uh, and for that, we use matrix population modeling, um, as Paolo mentioned also during uh, his presentation. So at that time in 2017, we implemented a deterministic model, a simple model based on the life cycle graph that you can see here on the right. And this model informed us that 47% of the reproductive females, that means the adult females, have to be sterilized to reach a null growth, okay? So it represents 135 females of the population to reach this objective. So we start the sterilization, but first we selected uh, how. So based on this objective, we actually got inspiration from the Hong Kong program. So I will not go in, in details about the methods because it's very similar uh, that um, what Paolo and, and his team do um, in Hong Kong. But we target females um, to have a better control because of the female philopatry, the male migration and the polygamous uh, mating system in that species. We chose tubectomy uh, as permanent nurturing technique because it requires only one capture and it preserves the hormonal function, as I said before. So we want to maintain natural behavior. So tubectomy has been uh, implemented by an endoscopic approach, which is minimally or at least least uh, invasive uh, than classic, uh, classical laparoscopy, and it allows a quick recovery and release of the monkeys. So for the trapping, we also used a uh, mass trapping, so a giant trapping cage, uh, mostly, um, which is recommended because it's most cost effective, it's less stressful for the monkeys and less dangerous, of course. Less dangerous than darting. So uh, very quickly, the trapping cages and the surgery room are all located within the sanctuary, as you can see on the map below. So it allows a quick uh, wall process from the capture, anesthesia, to clinical uh, exam and preparation of the monkeys, surgery, marking, sample collections for health screening, and finally recovery and release. So everything is done also the same day. So regarding the output of this program, um, we um, could sterilize 137 females. So you see, uh, we worked at a very smaller scale than uh, our, um, our colleagues in India and, and, and Hong Kong. But we did it over three years instead of one year. So the model told us that we should sterilize this number of females over one year, but we could not based on the challenge and the limitations of the, tra of the, the trapping. So um, this is, um, yeah, this is a very important output who explain why um, the success of this program is not uh, as expected. But uh, the surgery was safe um, and applicable also to pregnant females, depending on the pregnancy stage. The whole process from the trapping to release list uh, last three hours and a half. And we also conducted post-op monitoring of the treated animals and it reveals no major complication and a very good survival rate and success rate of, of this approach. Okay, but what about the efficacy on population growth? So I have um, represented here again the same graph, but with the last census data, so after 2017. And uh, we can see, uh, based on the demographic monitoring, that we did not reach our objective. We did not stop the population growth uh, since the abundance uh, is still increased. So there are many reasons explaining that. Also, um, 
uh, including a better census uh, method so we counted more groups. But the major reasons is also that um, we were not quick enough. So the sterilization effort, the yearly sterilization effort was too low. Uh, we took too much time. So what we did next, um, uh, in 2020, we tested the model again, and we refined this metric population model by including new census data and the sterilized uh, females in the life cycle graph, as you can see here, in addition of the intact females. And we also include uh, stochasticity in the model, and especially the epidemic risk, because uh, it's very important to have a stochastic model and not, an, not a deterministic model. So that allows us to make projections uh, for the future trends until 2040. And I present here two uh, scenarii uh, of the, the stochastic projections. So the color you can see uh, that you can see represent the different stages. Um, so the different age and sex uh, classes, okay? With the sterile females in, in, in purple. So the first model on the left, uh, show um, the population trends with no more sterilization from 2020. So it's it's a, a control uh, scenario if you want. So you can see that if we do not sterilize uh, um, again um, any monkeys after a stability of the population until 2030, we will experience again an exponential growth of the population. So definitely we need to uh, pursue the sterilization, but at which rate? That's the question. So the second scenario uh, show again that um, to reach a stability in the abundance, to stop the growth, uh, we have to sterilize again every year, in what, not every year, in one year, 50% of all the reproductive females. And we have to do that every four years. So at any time, we need to have 50% of the females, the adult females, which are sterile. Okay. So we have started again uh, the new sterilization campaigns in 2022, and we continue, uh, we continue the demographic uh, follow-up. So in conclusion, uh, based on this study case at a very small scale, uh, we can learn that to be effective sterilization program requires very significant and regular effort on a long term. So it's time and cost consuming, but it can be efficient as showed by um, the Hong Kong experience. But given the weak cost effectiveness, it seems very crucial to, to calibrate the intervention, to model uh, the demographics before the intervention. And that requires demographic data, which is sometimes very difficult to, to get. Uh, we totally agree with that. But still, we critically lack uh, published data on nurturing program. So we will certainly benefit from sharing our experience uh, as we do today. And finally, we emphasize the necessity of the long-term monitoring to critically assess efficacy and behavioral side effects. So um, I will now let uh, Gwenan present the behavioral implications of tubectomy on this population. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so I, I would like to thank you for the invitation and thank you for all the talk. It was really informative. And uh, for my part, I will talk to you about the sterilization impact on social uh, dynamics in the urban female matrix in Bali. So, um, <clears throat> oh, I got some problems here. Oh, okay, please. We can, oh, okay. So, <clears throat> um, so, why I have this? I don't think, I'm sorry, just one minute. Okay. So, <clears throat> the object, uh, the objective of my PhD three were to assess the effect of the reproductive statue of the uh, long tail macaque. So on three parameters. So first, uh, the female social organization. So 
uh, given the matrilineal organization and the role of infant as attractive and mediators of female relationship, we predict that a sterilized female could suffer from uh, less female female grooming and loss centrality within the female uh, affiliative network. Uh, second, the female sexual behavior. So given the fact that this population has uh, seasonal breeding and that tubectomy may in induce continuous cycling, we predict that sterilized female will show an increase of sexual activity and especially uh, regarding uh, perceptive and receptive uh, sexual behaviors. And finally, uh, the female sexual competition. So sterilization could uh, modify the operational uh, sex ratio. So meaning the number of females sexually available per male at a given time. And uh, this um, uh, oper operational uh, rex, uh, sex ratio may imply with the sterilization uh, more female available longer. Um, the female will be available longer for mating and will lead uh, consequently to an increase of sexual competition between uh, females. So basically measure, measures to uh, increase rate of agonistic interaction, but also could be seen through a decrease rate of grooming interactions. So for the method, we collected data over three years and we compare a sterilized female to intact ones. Uh, for the uh, collection technique, we use uh, focal sampling, 15 minutes focal sampling, and where we collect affiliative agonistic and sexual interaction to um, establish uh, social interaction networks. And we combine um, with, as well with um, proximity scan and uh, we have got uh, proximity uh, networks. And uh, to analyze the data, we, <laughs> we uh, use uh, causal inferences and a social network analysis tool with uh, ENDS package and NetDraw software. And we uh, use uh, weighted matrices and centrality matrix. So here's some results about our, re our research. So first on female social organization, we recently uh, published in animals an article about the effect of infant presence on female social networks in Balinese macaques. So on the short term, no impact of sterilization has been noticed. For example, here you have a grooming network for two groups, the Michelin and Utara groups. Uh, so in um, red here, you have the sterilized female and in blue here, you have the intact ones. And uh, we can show here that the sterilized female are not particularly more or less central, central than intact ones. However, we must uh, notice that, uh, that, the, um, that the majority of the females were uh, sterilized less than one year ago in the case of this study. So maybe the absence of new infants uh, for these females is not yet noticeable here and we must inv investigate on longer terms. Okay, so in uh, another study, we observed that the sterilized female had more female partners and were also more central uh, than intact female when we consider uh, five meters proximities. So we hypothesize that it may be linked to sexual inter interaction with uh, central male. <clears throat> So we went to check for the female sexual behaviors. And here we use a technique of uh, causal inference of events and, and Rubin. And we uh, investigate on two parameters. First, the behavior. And second, the number of rel relative partners. So first, uh, we investigate on perceptivity. So meaning uh, the female active behaviors uh, to initiate and uh, maintain uh, sexual interaction. So here you can see that the sterilized female 
tend to be to more uh, more solicit males than intact females, but not regarding the number of partners. So again, the female attractivity for men here, we can see that the sterilized female tend, tend also to be um, more attractive for men than intact female, and they uh, attracted definitely more men than intact females. And, fin and finally, the female receptivity, so meaning the propensity of the female to accept the copulation with the males. So here uh, we can see that the sterilized uh, female copulates significantly more uh, with more males also than intact females. So sterilized female were not more uh, proceptive here than intact female, but were uh, definitely more uh, attractive and receptive. Okay, let's check now for the female sexual competition. We measure sexual competition first through agonism uh, between females, and we observe here uh, no difference for agonism emitted uh, or received from or towards uh, other females. However, we notice the opposite prediction uh, the, we notice the, uh, the opposite to our, predict, uh, to our prediction. We we were um, uh, predict uh, we were predicted that the, there is an increase of aggression for the sterilized female and an increase of uh, number of partners. But here we can see that the sterilized female were aggressed by less female than intact female here. Okay, so what about competition through uh, grooming behaviors now? Here we saw that the sterilized female had less um, female partner from whom they receive grooming. But sterilized female groom also more uh, female partners than intact female did, suggesting maybe a possibility to balance the affiliative exchange. So uh, sterilization did not seem to clearly impact female sexual competition and uh, other mechanisms were probably at play here to explain these significant results. Uh, to summarize the main results, we uh, found no negative short-term impact of sterilization on the affiliative networks of females. However, we uh, definitely have to pursue observation on longer period uh, in order to better assess the potential adverse effect of the permanent absence of new offspring for sterilized female and of course also of uh, group demographic change. Um, it also appears that tubectomy accounts for modulation of behavior in treated females they became over time more active, uh, so more sexually receptive and attractive to men, while not uh, necessarily more aggressive with other females. And finally, an interesting question is, does female uh, sterilization influence male sexual competition? We need to go deeper in the investigation on the operational sex ratio and uh, sterilized female uh, ratio influence. Uh, we must also study the male-female and male-male relationships uh, to do that. We also need to correl and correlate behaviors with hormone data and the ovarian cyclicity of sterilized and intact females. So to conclude and go beyond this study case, I would like first to emphasize that uh, integrate long-term long behavioral uh, monitoring is a crucial step in management action plans. Then, despite an increased use, we still critically lack uh, published data on nurturing program with free-ranging primates. So here we call for systematic investigation of the be behavioral side effects and efficacy of those programs in, in terms of demographic control and conflict mitigation. This will help to provide evidence-based guidelines to support pre-intervention uh, decision and implementation of such programs. 
Uh, we should not forget that sterilization is time and cost demanding and must be combined with uh, parallel uh, measures such as educational, feeding regulation, and environmental action. And finally, an important point is that Macaca fascicularis has been recently classified as an endangered species at the global scale. So we now must consider the long tail macaque at a local scale, but also at a more global scale for the sustainability of the species. So I would like to thank all my collaborators and um, funding organizations who helped us with this project. And I would like to thank you all for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you very much, both Gwenin and Fanny. That's important research. And obviously, there's not very much of it, it seems, uh, relevant to this subject. So I'm very, very glad that you've come and told us about your work today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we now have uh, about half an hour's worth of um, comments and questions from participants. So everybody at this point is free to turn on their cameras and their microphones. Um, if you have anything to say, please uh, use the raise hand function, which is if you at the, at the bottom of your screen, you should have a reactions menu and raise hand is in there. And I'll, I'll try to call on you as, um, as you show up. And just to reiterate, it's a, it's a strange uh, event format today, but it's, we're just seeing how it goes. Um, we're going to do a questions and comments session now, and your questions and comments will be addressed during the panel discussion, which is the last session of the day. So there won't be immediate answers, but we're going to sort of see what the main themes are that people are interested in. So um, uh, Tang, Sarah, Elliot, uh, I don't know if you need to change permissions so people can use their cameras and microphones at this point, but if you do, please do so. <laughs> Thank <Yep>. you. <laughs> Everyone can turn on and can open the mic now. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, does anybody have anything to ask or to say? And and if if nobody does immediately, I can always um, I can always start out with some of the observations we've been making along the way. Okay, well, just to start then, uh, I want to ask, uh, Gwenin, you were talking about um, the short-term social effects of sterilization and, and, and so on. Um, and I'm curious, you were pointing out the need for long-term research on the social effects of sterilization and, and of course, how that, that, that's directly re relevant to welfare. Um, are you going to be continuing this study uh, mm -hmm. and and also is there anybody else doing similar work that you're aware of okay so currently uh, I'm the end of my PhD so I'm writing my thesis so <laughs> I'm at the end of this project but of course I hope uh, the project will continue even if I'm not here anymore even if also I would like to, to co keep going but uh, <laughs> It will be maybe someone else for the next steps. And uh, for now, um, I think we, um, I, I, I'm not aware of all the program existing and all the research about it, but I think from what I know, we are uh, uh, probably the, um, the team who collects uh, more data on behavioral aspects. So I don't currently know anybody else to collecting such data for now. But I hope for the future it will uh, be more and more people because I think uh, uh, knowing the impact of this uh, sterilization technique is really uh, important. For now we uh, only know about the short-term uh, effects, but we have no idea about the long-term impact of uh, the absence of a new infant for the sterilized female and for uh, the impact on the social group in general. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to call on Mikhail. Pardon my pronounce, pronouncement if that's wrong. 
Mikhail, would you like to ask a question? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hi there. Hello? Hi, we can hear you. Yeah, I so said good afternoon, Please. everyone. Turn left. My question is, I have listened to two presenters. They have presented about the contraceptive. The last presenter did about long tail macaques. My question here is, did she put into consideration either doing invasive or non-invasive method? And did she put into consideration the whole program of contraception, contraception in macaques is toward mitigating conflict. Okay, choosing surgery as a means of contraception, how possible it is the, 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 the coverage, how effective it's going to be considering the population of macaques, the way they reproduce. So that means would she keep on doing surgery to vectomy, to vectomy or what? Any other means? Hello? Hi, hi. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a slightly difficult connection. Um, so I, I apologize. It's okay. <laughs> Do I need to come back again? My question is, hello? Hi, please go ahead, yeah. yes. Yeah, my question is, they put into consideration doing tubectomy laparoscopy, laparoscopy in the, on the female, controlling only the female. And this method, mostly surgical. So yeah. it's surgical. I, I look at it as invasive. Okay. One. And the coverage, considering the population of wild tails, or considering population of the macaques, how many surgery will you do to affect that? And they are still reproducing. Okay. This okay. is my own question. What is their own consideration before that? I am Great. talking from Malaysia. Um, we are doing our own project on long tails macaques. We put all those into consideration. So we decide to come up with non-invasive methods okay. of contraception. And, and what is the method that you're using? We are trying to do non-invasive okay. method because the cases of conflict of macaques affect everyone. So what we want to bring about is something that, okay, people have become used to feeding macaques. So we want to come up with a formulation that the macaque will take quietly and the effect will manifest in their reproductive rate without stressing the animals and stressing. Okay, great. Um, we are taking note of these questions and this is one of the themes that we'll discuss during the panel discussion. That's perfect. That's it's okay. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, does anybody else have a question or a comment to move forward with? May I have a question, please? Of course, go ahead, Gunung. <clears throat> yeah, uh, my question is, uh, which is the common way uh, of uh, contraception for the uh, macaques? Uh, is it uh, through surgery or non-surgery? Uh, our organization has, uh, we are new in the, uh, uh, rescue center, but we only last week we we inaugurate a new re, uh, macaque rescue center in Sumatra, and we still have limited facility. We only have one socialization and closer, and we are going to combine in the same uh, enclosure the long-tailed macaques and the pig-tailed macaques and. At the same time, we are trying to avoid hybrid of spring in our center. So that's why I would like to uh, listen some experience from uh, any one of you about uh, 
this is the common way and the easiest way for the contraceptions of uh, the macaques. Is it uh, through surgery or non-surgery? Okay, that's another good, interesting question. We're gonna take note of that for discussion during the panel discussion. Um, and I'll just note here that of course, the considerations for, for using contraception in a captive situation there will be some similar considerations, but obviously the details will be different. So it'll be interesting to hear the contrast uh, between what people are thinking for wild macaque populations and captive macaque populations. Um, Sirjana, you have a question or a comment? Yes, uh, a question actually. Uh, um, of all the programs that everybody's doing uh, in different countries, um, do you also uh, vaccinate the uh, um, uh, monkey against rabies before releasing? Because in India, we do see a spillover in uh, urban areas, you know, monkeys biting livestock or dogs or humans. So um, what, what is uh, happening in that regard? Because I see that there is a conflict in all the presentations that we have seen today. So are you also looking at that angle and vaccinating the population, the monkeys, captured monkeys before uh, releasing them? Okay, good question. Another good one. Um, any other questions or comments for the upcoming panel discussion? <laughs> oh, I think I hear somebody, but I can't. Uh, I, I, I have uh, another uh, question. Yes, that of course. What are, the, what are the best methods? Are there any recommended methods for, um, for mapping uh, the macaque population? Because a lot of uh, you are doing it. And in India, still, you know, the sterilization is randomly happening. We don't have, the government does not put any input into mapping the uh, population and using the census. So, you know, like uh, Paolo mentioned that how they are capturing group of monkeys and uh, is there any way they are identifying or, you know, doing, how, how is this census happening? Like in India is a large country and uh, in, we have macaques uh, around, I mean, I think in most of the states, but depending population may vary. Uh, so if we want to like target one place, how do we map? Because there is nothing being done right now. So maybe, you know, some good and easy mapping techniques that we can put into uh, a policy document for the government. If people can explain or, you know, comment on that. That sort of relates to a question I had for you, in fact, Sirjana. <laughs> and it was about whether, um, whether you know there are... Uh, like who is working on these issues in the context of these different Indian programs? Is it, are there primatologists involved in these decisions or is it governmental departments with maybe limited actual uh, primate knowledge and experience? And I hope that that's going to be a, a, a something that you guys all discuss extensively in the upcoming session. Thank you. Um, Fiona was next. Oh. Hi, apologies Hi. there. Um, mm -hmm. I have a question and hopefully maybe uh, Paolo and Carthy can, can comment because I think that a lot of the focus is on the targeted interventions on the macaques, but a lot of the issues we see as Paolo uh, alluded to is um, human behavior um, sort of change as well, sort of triggering conflicts or overreacting to seeing monkeys in the wild, uh, being frightened, having negative experience. So I think um, some more discussion um, on human behavior change and how we can take that and actually get the impact that we want in terms of more tolerance and also stopping nuisance behaviors in the humans as opposed to focusing on the, the macaques that may be just performing normal behaviors for them. Okay, great. These are all being noted down, just so you know. Um, Dinesh, you're next. Yeah, thank you. 
Hello. So, uh, yeah, uh, my question is, uh, have uh, any of the program uh, calculated that what is the cost of the program? I mean, what is the cost involved per, per macaque? I mean, is there any estimation of, you know, what is the cost benefit? So what, what cost per macaque is involved for this program? That is the one question. And second is, is there any cheaper method or economical method that can be used in the resource poor settings? Because like the Hong Kong, whatever the Bali, they, they did again, they learn from the Hong Kong. So, and the Bali themselves have, I think, very less population. And, but like India, it's a huge population. So it's a problem uh, for us, the resources, funding resources is a big problem. So in that case, we would like to see what are the cheaper option, options or, you know, economical options so that we can control our uh, control this population. So these are my two questions. So not specific to one, but this is the open for, I mean, if anyone can help us. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, there is a comment in the chat uh, from Nicholas, and I'm going to read this out here. Um, and it says, how do macaque breeding facilities for labs and other commercial use relate and react to the sterilization and other population control programs, since at least some of them capture wild macaques, and because of the recent change in long-tailed macaques IUCN status, I'm guessing they would have some difficulties and maybe prefer the absence of sterilization programs so they can go on with captures. Again, that's really interesting. I'm looking forward to hearing what you all have to say about that. Um, I'm not sure whether such captures are happening in the areas where each of you work, but we know for sure that they're happening in some areas. Um, Dinesh, do you have another question or is your hand just still up from previously? No. Oh, it was <laughs> previous, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, any other comments or questions right now? If not, uh, what we can do is we've, so we've been noting these down um, and we can go off and take a short break now. And in the meantime, we'll, we'll uh, those of us behind the scenes, will just have a look at the different sort of comments and questions. And so the reason we've organized it this way is basically so we can get an idea of what you most want to know from the people who are the experts here today. Um, so it's a little bit early to go off for the break, but that's okay. We'll, we'll go off for the break now. Um, and we'll come back at, well, 55 minutes past the hour for most of us. But if you're in India, it is two, uh, 1.25 PM when we'll resume. Um, and if anybody didn't, didn't ask a question or make a comment and you would like to, please do feel free to go ahead and do so in the comments right now. Okay, but for now we can all just go have a break and uh, get ready for the panel discussion. Thanks a lot. We've made notes of everybody's questions. We've tried to sort of group them into some different themes. And I think what I'll do is I'll just kind of read off these different themes to you now as a means to start off the discussion. Um, I'll let you all take it away and discuss, but I might uh, interject a few specific questions based on what we have recorded, um, you know, while you're talking. <laughs> so um, let's see, do we have everybody on screen that we need to? We have... Um, I think we do. Uh, is is Dinesh here? I'm here. Okay. Do you want to turn? <clears throat> do you have a camera that you can turn on for the panel discussion? Yes. yes. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, 
so the main the main sorts of questions that came up with um, to start with, um, we were curious about how public attitudes towards the monkeys and towards the sterilization programs compare between these different locations, between Hong Kong, between the different parts of India, and between and and Bali, um, and <laughs> alongside public attitudes. Um, opportunities for funding programs. Uh, it sounds as though in India, uh, uh, somebody used the word quick fix. Um, it sounds as though there's a, a, an issue and they needed to be seen to be doing something. So they may have implemented a program that uh, wasn't well considered, well researched and well implemented. So um, how do governments move from, oh, here's my cat. <laughs> how do governments move from uh, quick fixes to really well-considered programs. And, and I think maybe Philip would be a good person to answer that. So there are other themes that will come up, but I'll leave you with that and see if any of you have anything to say about that. Philip, would you like to start in talking about how, uh, how Hong Kong came to sort of want to to implement a well-considered program yes yes sure and first of all thank you for for for, for inviting us to join the uh, symposium which is uh, uh quite a very food souls um presentations and learn about the situations in different countries indeed uh i actually actually hong kong shared the similar uh situations for a while when I uh, do a similar presentations in Singapore, uh, they came across similar situations. So uh, as Palos mentioned in his presentations, uh, Hong Kong has adopted a multi-pronged approach since uh, 1999, uh, including the, um, uh, contraceptive programs, which is a, a kind of main elements in the uh, context of human, wild animals, or I should say human and maquettes context management. And also we have uh, law enforcement and the um, uh, education and uh, let's see, yes, and the, uh, 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 the survey different elements to manage uh, the context between human and maquettes. So back to the contraceptive programs, I guess most of the participants are interested in the cost because I, I, I heard from some of the participants uh, and uh, questions about the cost. So um, uh, indeed it is open to the public. Uh, for the uh, contraceptive programs and, uh, uh, and some peripheral pro uh, programs, it costs around uh, two million Hong Kong dollars per financial years. So, and besides the uh, contraceptive programs, we also engaged um, uh, Ocean Park Conservation Foundations to do the uh, education program, because as um, uh, one of the, one of the participants' um, questions about uh, apart from uh, population control humans' perceptions on uh, market uh, nuisance is one of the major elements in maquettes and humans' context. So what actually uh, the governments work on these perspectives? In fact, we uh, do lots of educations, uh, 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 or should say we educate the publics on how to uh, uh, positively um, uh, faced the wild animals, especially uh, monkeys in the wilds. It's a kind of manners to, to learn how to or should, uh, interact with wild animals in the wilds. So uh, we think um, only relies on um, contraceptive program itself. Uh, I should say um, contraceptive a program is a, a major element on doing the population's control in the long run to manage the populations of maquettes to alleviate the nuisance. But human perceptions of wild animals, especially uh, like a monkey, 
is also one of the major elements. So we do lots of educations, education booth that in the Kamsan country parks to educate the publics and do school talks to educate the next generations on how to uh, face the wildlife, especially monkeys. So um, to gather all these elements in Hong Kong, uh, actually in Palo's uh, presentations in 2006, we received more than 1,400 uh, complaints uh, each year. Uh, sorry, uh, 2006, uh, uh, sorry, 1,400 complaints in 2006. But now in recent years, we received uh, around uh, 200 something complaints. Indeed, our management approach is a, a kind of a complaints driven. And we can see with all these elements in the management program, it does have a, a kind of positive results in managing the human and the Marquette's context. So we, we regard it as a kind of a, a, a good story in, in managing the human and wild uh, Marquette's context. So regarding the contraceptive itself, I may pass to Palos and see whether he has any supplement in the program. Hello, you, think, yeah. Yeah, re regarding regarding the cost, uh, I don't have the full picture uh, compared to, to you because we look at the narrow aspect of uh, the sterilization program. The uh, cost to set up is uh, considerable because the equipment is uh, sophisticated. However, we've been using the same equipment for 10 years. So in, in that sense, uh, it, it's no longer expensive to, to use and to run. The secret there is that it's a longitudinal project. We know we'll be doing it in 10 years. You wouldn't buy the kind of equipment to do a quick fix. You wouldn't buy the kind of equipment or make the kind of investment to answer a political tweet. That would be that would be a bad allocation of resources. You know, you want to answer you want to answer a political tweet. You make an ecological tweet or whatever. But you you, you have to uh, you have to consider what is worth investing in, in that. And uh, if we look at the cost now um, of the of the project, I would say if you extend it over the last twelve years and and the next ten, uh, it's not that high. We work a lot with volunteers. Um, we work with uh, mostly local staff, so there, there isn't a major component anymore. Uh, it's not the same when we go and do campaigns in other countries, then suddenly the investment, if they were paying what they should be paying for it, would be quite considerable. So it, it is difficult to, to answer the, the, the cost. The other thing is that when you, when you look at the cost of a project, if you're in a country, if you're in a situation uh, like we have seen where the problem with the macaque is not complaint driven, it's livelihood driven. So in, in Hong Kong, the marker is how many complaints is your KPI. I go from a thousand to a hundred, it's a successful program because it means people have learned to live with macaques better. That was the objective. If you're, in a, if you're in a situation where the objective is to stop the macaques from destroying the crops of people who then go hungry, then your KPI cannot be how many are sterilized or how many are still complaining about it. It has to be something else. And uh, how do you cost the loss of crops? Is that part of the cost we're talking about? You know, so it becomes a, a much more. It has to be a much more holistic conversation. So, if let's say you if you if you're working in a city and you're trying to get rid of a population of monkey that got trapped in a city, like say Delhi or, or you know Jakarta, there's a population of monkeys stuck there. If you work at eradicating the monkeys from there, it's okay. No ecological impact. The city is rich. They can afford the program. It's fine. It's a totally different situation than if you're looking at the region where the monkeys belong. They've been there longer than people have. Uh, you have to find a, a way of living together. So your, your program would have to be totally, totally different. And I think the difficulty in having this conversation is that we, we have to find, we have to really define what plane we're talking on. Uh, are we discussing this situation, this kind of conflict? What are our KPIs? What do we call a success? We call a success, reduce the complaint by, by 75%. That's the target goal that we call it a success, fine. Or we call it a success, we uh, lose, uh, instead of losing uh, 50 tons of crop in a year, we lose 10. You know, 
decide these kind of targets first. And then you realize that there are some similarities within contraceptive projects, but actually there are more differences than similarities. I, I'm not trying to elude the question, it's just that that's it. Um, if I may add as well, I think the cost discussion is very uh, difficult because uh, we do come from a city that's one of the most expensive city to live in. So, you know, you have to base that on the costing. I assume with the holistic mitigation efforts, like changing a bin, you know, your waste management probably is much cheaper in India than actually in Hong Kong, where we have to tender out how to change the bin and it's going to cost fortune. So I think that asking cost to cost, dollar to dollar, it's not as relevant. I think, you know, all mitigation has to be context specific. You know, are we dealing with urban uh, issues or are we dealing with crop issues? You know, so putting a fence perhaps to protect a crop may be cheaper in India than if we were to do that in Hong Kong. You know, so just be mindful of when we ask for what's the cost. But when it comes to actually like the endoscopic technique itself, yes, that maybe you know there is a standard cost to that but again we've been using it for 12 years so you know over time the cost is not actually the investment of the equipment initially but over time it's more the manpower around it which again you know like countries in india or indonesia could be way much cheaper and if i can say one last thing before giving the the word back is also you, you have to decide if the cost is worth it is contraception your priority here? If you if you're trying to stop monkeys from coming into an area where the dustbins are exposed, there, there's no amount of contraception that's going to help you there, because the problem is not the number of monkeys. The problem is that you're inviting the monkeys over because you're offering free food. Of course, they'll come, sterilized or otherwise. So at that point, I would recommend invest nothing in contraception. Invest everything in public education, waste management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so. I'd like to ask Fanny and Gwenin, uh, the program that you're working with, um, how is it funded? And I'm interested to know, I'm assuming it's at least partially government funded, but that could be wrong. And I'm interested to know, um, I'm, in, I'm interested to know about like political will. There's a political will to solve a problem really quickly or, or to have a quick fix, but there's also a political will to actually fix it like everybody supports spending the money and the time to fix it and i'm curious to know how you how you manage that how you obtain that if that makes any sense yeah it it, it makes definitely sense um thank you so first i would like to to say that i totally agree with uh with um, paolo uh with, with mark it's a very difficult issue and it's, it's difficult to compare the cost from one country to to another one but um for the bali uh, point of view <clears throat> so i i'm not aware about a global um, governmental uh, strategy to mitigate uh, human macaque conflict i think it's um you know uh, for bali it's really um community-based approach. That means uh, every community uh, invests uh, in different strategies. And so, it, yeah, I, I, I do not have a global um, answer for the country. I, I can just talk about Bali. So in our case, how do we uh, fund this program? Um, it's uh, mostly funded by the local stakeholders, by the village community. That's the first uh, source of funding, but due to COVID uh, situation, of course, the, um, the means, the economic means were uh, decreased a lot. So we looked for uh, additional uh, uh, funds from a private donation. So we also have um, some uh, private foundation who helped to, to conduct the last program. If I can just to give, to give an idea for, for Bali, um, we assess that after the equipment, the endoscope equipment have been bought, which is the most expensive part, um, one monkey, uh, sterilization tubectomy on one monkey cost 50,000, uh, 50 euro, 50 euro per monkey. So it's just to give you, yeah, an idea of how much it cost, uh, it cost for us. So, um, yeah, um, I think as Paolo said, 
Sterilization cannot be the only uh, solution. It should, it's really uh, specific to each situation. And you have to understand where, what are the cause of the complaints? What are the cause of the conflict? And, and frequently it's not necessarily the number of monkeys. It's really based on, on human behavior and, and, and monkey behavior. So educational and um, um, educational actions which are conducted in Singapore, in in, uh, in Hong Kong, are really important as well. So I don't know if I answer your question. I just give a, a short uh, idea of how much it costs for us. Great. Um, uh, Sujana and Dinesh, um, I'm uh, so following from all this, um, clearly, uh, different governments I, I, i'm assuming that these are different departments working completely separately rather than under one unified umbrella but they they do want to do something which is why they're doing something i don't know whether it's because they want to solve the problem or because they need to be seen to do something um but i'm just interested to know what your thoughts are for like um uh, speaking to them um and and convincing them to sort of invest the time and resources into um, tailoring their approach so that it is more effective and so that it is humane as well. Um, and that's related, of course, to what the people in these different regions support. W is there, is there, what are public opinions like? Are, is the public happy that governments are spending money on trying to do these things humanely? Or would people rather that not happen? What's the situation? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'll um, uh, start with a small fact that uh, for me, it is really interesting uh, that, uh, you know, the NGOs are doing uh, macaque birth control programs because in India, uh, macaques are under wildlife protection. So unlike the dog population management programs that are run by NGOs, uh, all Indian macaque sterilization programs are undertaken by a government only. So this is, uh, you know, uh, interesting for me that uh, in uh, other countries, NGOs are allowed to do it. Uh, another thing is uh, just, you know, speaking uh, very broadly, uh, I, I am not generalizing, but uh, you know, in India, there are divided opinions. Like some of the people will be pro-sterilization. There are huge groups of people due to, you know, religious reasons or reasons of their own. People are not very pro-sterilization for any animal for that matter. And uh, see, uh, uh, as far as the program goes or the methods go, um, I would say the general consensus is that there should be no cruelty and uh, people would generally complain if they see cruelty. But again, you know, totally depends on situation. If you are an affected community, if you are affected by the situation, so, you know, then you want uh, government to do everything to, uh, you know, get rid of macaques or monkeys in that area. And people will you know, poison uh, those monkeys if government doesn't do anything. If there are no steps taken, people will, you know, uh, take killing in their own hands. Uh, but again, you know, like it is a, a very contrasting situation in India. It is indeed very interesting because as I said, you know, uh, there are some temples that are full of monkeys. People go and feed monkeys in these temples. They are protected. On the other hand, you see conflict and you see people killing monkeys. So, you know, the situation is not, I would not say it is uniform. You will see support, you will see totally, you know, um, animal people and especially the affected people, they will always be, um, you know, in the favor that animals be removed and for that matter, any animal. And it is not only the issue of macaques in India, we also have other animals that are declared vermin and are killed. So, but definitely, you know, the farmers or the affected communities, they will have different opinions. But if you see, you know, generally as a country, um, I would say we are very uh, pro-animal welfare and uh, people 
uh, you know they have in general religiously they have like compassion for animals in india and there are a number of due to various reasons like religious reasons or you know our cultural reasons so that is the situation yeah i i just want to add some hello hi please go ahead yeah yeah i mean uh, it is totally contextual what the paulo is saying because uh, india is a very diversified country so it is a contextual and what the target is whether we want to reduce the complaint or whether we want to reduce the crop damage or human conflict so this depend on the uh, we need to fix the first of all target and uh, it's it's very really uh, it's difficult to say i mean if the problem with the farmers then definitely they will demand to the government to run such programs but as said uh, as sejna said that there are monkeys uh, in the temples or in the you know other places where they do not harm to the people so there is no problem so that's it's a mixed kind of uh, i mean opinion and and uh, india since you know the historically <laughs> uh, known as a companion you know we are a compassionate people towards always towards the animals but over the last 30 40 years maybe the multiple factors why the people nowadays you know become so materialistic and you know i mean there are multiple reasons maybe the the uh, climate change competition for the food and you know so multiple factors which we do not know but these are the some factors because of that that there is uh, to understand not only the monkey behavior but need to understand the human behavior as well how they treat, treat the animals so it's a uh, interdependence yeah okay thank you thank you thank you all um i wanted to move on to some sort of more technical questions about procedure and stuff um we had a comment about um potential invasiveness of the so surgery is invasive um and uh there are some situations and places who would like to avoid that if necessary or maybe it is necessary um are there any alternatives to surgery um and if so are they effective and are they actually any more humane than surgery if it's done you know efficiently and effectively um related to that uh particularly for for the two for for Bali and for Hong Kong um who is doing the actual capturing and procedure and what sort of training are they receiving so you don't need to answer those questions specifically but if if you all just want to sort of address that type of theme the technical aspects of it that would be great and maybe we can start with Fanny and Gwenin Okay. Um <clears throat> so I I completely agree and understand that it it uh, surgery uh, looks invasive but actually we have to think um especially about the capture why we choose surgery instead of chemical contraception is because in a single shot in a single capture uh which is of course stressful for 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 the animal for sure Uh, but uh, you can have a permanent sterilization if you use chemical contraception first i think but maybe uh, paulo can answer better than me i think it's uh, more expensive than than surgery because it's on a long term and you have to capture multiple times the the animal because the contraceptive or not uh, has a short term uh, effect so we try to do the least invasive surgical approach by using endoscopy Uh, by the, do not disturbing um, hormonal function so yeah in terms of capture I, i think surgery is less invasive and less disturbing and and more welfare um, um, uh, effective than um, than chemical contraception so yeah that's um, at least that's my part of the answer maybe paulo can complete yeah we we reached the same uh, the same conclusions um, in terms 
if we're talking about wild populations, yeah, we're not talking about animals in a cage under your complete control. Yeah, we're talking about animals that are in the wild, uh, interfacing with people. The most uh, cost-effective and least uh, invasive uh, thing you can do is bother it as little as possible. And if you catch it once and the job is done, it will always be less invasive than capturing it several times. Uh, so in terms of immunocontraception or long-acting contraception injectables, uh, definitely uh, surgical sterilization will be cheaper and uh, more uh, welfare-oriented uh, in, the, in that sense. When it comes to oral contraception, really don't bother because uh, all, it, all it takes is one failure. You'll have a baby and, it, and you're doing all that for nothing. You'll have people on the ground all day, every day to not miss a uh, dose. A complete waste of time. Uh, you can do that if you have one or two animals in a cage under your control. It's done, it works, but uh, it's something to be totally excluded at the population level. So my advice is to don't go down the road, you're just wasting time and uh, money, and then you're losing support from the people who are actually your, your stakeholders uh, because they're expecting results. So that, that would be my, my approach. And the, the manpower on a daily basis for such an ambitious program as to give uh, a, a contraceptive tablet to every monkey in the country every day, it's just fantasy, fantasy based. Yeah. So surgery is definitely the most uh, welfare friendly and the cheaper in the long term. Uh, if I may add, I think the most stressful part of the entire procedure is trapping. Yeah. So it's beyond the actually doing the surgery because once you anesthetize animal, you actually have control. Trapping is very stressful for the animals. So I think that if you are going to have any kind of program and knowing that long-term goal, what it is, you know, whether you want to do a temporary contraception, which means then you will be trapping them over and over a lot more times. Or do you want to then manage your population and say that, okay, if I'm going to do a procedure, I'm going to stress this animal. During that trapping, I'm going to do a, uh, you know, permanent sterilization. So I think, yeah, you have to look at that in the context and just saying surgery is invasive because you may just do it once and you never have to do it again. Uh, instead of, you know, uh, um, immunocontraception or anything that this is not permanent procedures, you may have to then repeat this over time for a much longer time. Yeah. And, and also, if you saw the figures from, uh, from our presentation, you can see that after 10 years of uh, immunocontraception, the recruitment rate of the population was identical to that of a natural population. So yeah, we haven't done modeling and so on, but 10 years speak for themselves. It, it, it hasn't made a dent in the natural recruitment, so don't, don't bother them. Um. Somebody did ask whether monkeys are vaccinated while they're under anyway for 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 surgical procedures. And uh, I'm wh what about in Hong Kong? Are they vaccinated for anything in particular, or 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 are any other health procedures done while they're under? Yeah. We we do um, have a certain uh, uh, protocol. So every animal receives an antibiotic and a painkiller as part of the. Um, physical examination and uh, processing standards. Every animal receives uh, uh, deworming. Um, and uh, it probably, they get new worms the day after we release them, uh, but uh, it doesn't matter. It's just kind of something nice to do to an animal you have in hand, you know. We're causing a certain amount of uh, stress, so we give a certain benefit back. We get rid of some parasites in the way it's done in that spirit. When it comes to vaccination, we are um, vaccinating against rabies, but that's more of a local regulation uh, to do with the rabies ordinance. Uh, Hong Kong is rabies free, but our neighboring countries are not. So we try to protect the, the stray animals, the domestic animals, and now the, the monkeys that uh, against uh, possible epidemics and so forth. I just shared a, a link to a paper we recently published on, on the results of the rabies vaccination and it explains a bit the rationale behind it. So again, local uh, local uh, requirements. If you're in a country where rabies is prevalent, um, it's always good to have less animals able to spread rabies around you. But it's, it, again, it's a cost benefit and uh, that's it. I don't think it's a requirement. Okay, and so on to the training, the trapping and the training. Um, 
in Hong Kong, who, who uh, you are in charge of the program, but you must have other people who are actually physically doing the trapping. And I, I'm interested to know in who they are and how they are trained for, for across the board for all of your different programs, um, whether it's uh, they need to be super specialists or or whether a short amount of training will do and um how successful is it um surely there things must go wrong sometimes but is is it is it pretty good in terms of success okay um i'll take this uh, opportunity to introduce under the carty martelli that's alex and kelly the our surveyors. So I think since the beginning of the program, we've always had surveyors going out. And uh, we also have, I think you, you saw from Paolo's uh, uh, presentation, the uh, cages that's actually designed by our government, AFCD, and we've been using that. So what happens on a habituation feeding? So the trapping doesn't happen in a day. It's a relationship. We've developed a relationship every single day, five days, a week, uh, you know, uh, Kelly and Alex uh, goes out and make contacts with these animals and they are habituated uh, every single day to enter the cages. So there is a lot of trust that's developed. And on a trapping day, what we do is then it is uh, controlled by a remote control. So then the once the animals are within the cage and we think it's safe, we then you know press a button, remote controlled by them, and then the doors will close. So then the monkeys are there. So we then you know put place a lot of tarpaulin around, make it visually safe, and they make sure that the animals within are safe. Uh, and, and quiet and undisturbed. So do they have special training to press the remote? No, but what is important is that relationship development over time with each and every group. So in the month where we trap animals, where we are doing it every two weeks, sometimes we do catch same groups in two weeks, you know, so because that's also because the trust that the surveyors has developed with the animals. So it's not a random catcher that today mm -hmm. I have like a head hunt, like a bounty hunt. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna catch 20 monkeys today, you know? And that's 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 not the relationship we have here because they also do the surveys. We have our population census as well as on the day once in a while, you know, it's not a nice relationship, but they are there at the end of the day, the next day going back, you know, continuing a relationship with the monkeys yeah so yeah and then in in terms of the the training uh, required uh we work a lot with volunteers some are regular volunteers some are not so we have uh, people who also supervise the operations uh there is no existing training where you can say okay i'm a certified monkey catcher we, 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 we don't have that in uh, in our toolbox um so what we do is we, we train them to our own standards. We have certain uh, safety procedure and supervision uh, ongoing when, when we're on site. Um, it's a difficult one to address because I heard the, the criticism and it's something that we often also look at when we evaluate other programs, are people trained? And it's a, it's a valid question and it's a valid standard. The problem is that such training may simply not exist so yeah, it's uh, it, it is it goes beyond just uh, uh, having a training cert. It, it really goes beyond having a system that is able to accommodate a certain amount of newcomers and uh, having equipment that's safe and so forth. That's why the, the partition in the cage where we no longer go in with the monkeys. The, in in the old days, uh, I'm talking pre two thousand and eight. The there there were nets involved and animals had to be caught by net in the cage. And we, we quickly changed that to, to having this moving partition. So the animals always feel like they're on the other side of a safe fence. So they don't feel the, the, the kind of stress. And as a result, by the end of the day, the exertion by the monkey is just walking up and down the cage instead of running around. It makes a big difference in terms of the stress. And uh, from the welfare point of view, it's a, it's a game changer. Yeah. I think that's also uh, like uh, in the presentation mentioning of the stakeholder discussion and the relationship because when we were netting, it was very, very stressful and very quickly we discussed with the government partners, you know, to, to change that and that was done pretty quickly as well.
Uh, what about in Bali? Yeah. I see here I can answer. Yeah, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Okay, uh, maybe you could complete if I uh, forget something, but uh, basically in Bali, it's uh, the staff who uh, put some food on the cage every morning, early morning. The difficulty uh, in comparison to Hong Kong, I think it's because uh, the uh, global area is already food provisioning, so it's a real challenge to get the monkey feeding in the cage while there is also sometimes food outside the cage because they have uh, they are really smart and uh, after we close the cage for the first time they learn the cage is dangerous of course so it's uh, really challenging so we try to avoid feeding them uh, outside the cage early morning but of course there is some uh, management require, uh, requirements because uh, uh, the problem is monkeys also going out from uh, the sanctuary area to go in the city early morning. So, uh, the, um, and they uh, put uh, food inside the monkey forest to try to feed them inside that early morning. It's um, uh, jeopardize uh, the effectiveness of the cage. But I think the cage is really um, important because uh, trapping collectively, I think, is less stressful than individually uh, because uh, monkeys uh, uh, stay uh, all together and we put, um, uh, uh, um, we cover the cage to uh, keep them in the dark to be more uh, quietful and uh, in a social way. So I think definitely it's less stressful, um, but I have no doubt uh, of this. It's just my personal opinion. And uh, about um, uh, we 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 have some uh, assistants, master student and PhD student who collect uh, who collect data on uh, um, the amount of monkey uh, coming around the cage and in the cage to evaluate the best moment to close the cage also uh, when, uh, during the day of capture. So it's really a long-term process of habituation for the cage, uh, at least, really at least six months <laughs> before closing the cage, we habituate them every day and it's a, a really long-term process. And we start again after closing the cage to, um, to, 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 to not lose this habituation, like, uh, well, of course, for the next campaign, we, we would like they use it again. So it's really uh, a challenge. And the, so the student collects some data to evaluate the best time to close the cage. And uh, also uh, there is um, a different group in the monkey forest. So the um, home range are quite different. So, um uh, we uh, know which room can uh, which room will use which cage but uh, as uh, uh, Paolo said before uh, we we could not be sure this day it will be this group and this certain of monkeys like random uh, of course there is a um, an influence of the do uh, dominance the hierarchy uh, between the groups who is effective and so we, we, we try sometimes when we don't want to forget one specific group, maybe to put food outside on their uh, home range area to attract maybe the submissive group in the cage uh, to try to target this group. But yeah, it's really, really challenging. And uh, for, uh, we, we want also for the observers who collect the data, uh, it's also important uh, to notice that sometimes we are uh, working on specific groups. So the day of the capture, we try to avoid that the observer who uh, collect data on this specific group is there the day of the capture because we don't want the monkeys uh, um, make a relationship between the old observer and the uh, day of the closing, uh, the, the closing day, the day of the capture. So. That's all of what I think about. Maybe Fanny, you want to add something? 
Now I think you you explain in, in detail how we 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 uh, processed. It's very similar um, as the uh, Hong Kong program. So we use the same cage with the same uh, uh, squeeze. You know the big trapping cage and then the small squeeze uh, cage. So the capture and anesthesia is done by trained staff and 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 vet and, and vet of course. And uh, plus, uh, indeed, um, the students, volunteers, and researchers monitor um, how many monkeys we have in the cage and when we have to close the cage. But in our case, as it went on, it's much more challenging because food is everywhere. But it's a really long term process. So I don't have um, other things to add. I think it's already a long answer. Do you use the same cage? By coincidence, or because you communicated beforehand, and and uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we contacted uh, Paolo and, and his team uh, before uh, building the cage. We we really got the inspiration of how we we do in Bali from Hong Kong. So it's uh, okay. It's a copy <laughs> of the Hong Kong. Program. <laughs> so there's opportunity to sort of uh, talk about design and 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 stuff like that. It sounds like, um, yeah. so. When I was trying to set up this event, I was trawling through the internet trying to find published work about sterilization programs in various places. I was really, really surprised at how how little there was. Um, and one of the only things I found about India was meant to be a study of one instance of trapping and sterilizing and, and all that. But it, as it turned out, uh, on the day that it was meant to happen, it all just failed miserably, and so they didn't have anything to report. Basically, um, it was uh, the, it, the the people who wrote the article were quite critical about how it was carried out, um, or not not carried out, as the case may be. I'm interested to know what you in India. Um, know about the methods that they normally use and how they differ uh, substantially from the, the ones we've just been discussing and, and whether you see any opportunity to work with various governments to, to improve that. And, and uh, after you tell me what you think, maybe any of you can, can contribute as to how, how things can be improved. Yeah. So, um, you know, as I said, that in India, NGOs are not running these programs. As far as uh, I know, uh, in cities, the capture is done uh, by municipal corporation people. And uh, they use, you know, their staff and uh, they catch the, do uh, catch the monkeys with nets. So, you know, generally throwing the net over a group of monkeys in the city or, uh, you know, running with a huge net, running after monkeys, you know, capturing uh, them from different sides. And uh, this is how it is done. Uh, I am not aware that how the governments in the hilly areas where they have proper sterilization programs, how are they capturing? Uh, are they using, if they are using, um, you know, if they are catching the animal individually using nets or if they are using um, uh, these uh, cages, I am not sure about that. And since it is done by the government, you know, we also uh, don't get a lot of information of how it is done. And um, again, it is, um, like I said, in the hilly areas, in, in a little, you know, urban uh, place in a hill, uh, it will be done by catching, by, you know, using a net. But maybe if they are using cages within or on the peripheries of the forest, I am not sure. But these people are definitely not trained. Um, there is no training program happening either for dogs, for even for dog catching. Generally, organizations train each other's staff. So for monkeys, I am not aware if there is any uh, catching training program. No, just I wanted to add, Sejna. Uh, actually, uh, these facilities uh, run by the government and they hire the local, I mean, the civil people and they pay around nine US dollars per day for the caching of these monkeys. 
so it's a it's a concern about the their training and their skill so that's why the in undercover investigation was done by peta and uh, pfa so there is a huge lack of lack of knowledge about the handling and uh, cap capturing the primates so that is uh, like very lacking which is a most stressful and uh, critical part of the sterilization program and uh, somehow i mean uh, since the, these are these have been run by the government i personally also didn't have a, an, had an opportunity to see the you know these uh, centers and the procedures but whatever the knowledge i mean we gained through the articles and these papers only and through the discussions yeah thank uh, you paulo and karti To, to continue on the on the trapping being the uh, the most uh, high risk and stressful part of the the procedures um, in in Hong Kong we we know it's is going to be for the long term and uh, we have several cages in several locations but they, they're quite cumbersome to move so we try to leave them there for a certain duration and some of the cages have been the same site for 10 years or more, and they're still very popular cages with the monkeys. And, and that's really due to the style of habituation. We, we, we try to make it sure that when the monkeys see the cage, they're associated with something that's worth entering the cage. So on a daily basis, they get their food there. And we make sure that we train the monkeys to go in, that it's not the monkeys who train us to put food in there. So what we do is that we go at a certain time, we give a certain call, we put a certain amount of food, if the monkeys don't come after a certain time, we take the food away. So the monkeys learn, okay, I have to be there on time. And you have to be consistent in that. If you wait for the monkey to show up, then the monkey is training you. And then it's very hard to plan the, the rest of the operation. So that, that's a fundamental aspect. In terms of the deployment of the trap, that's where you, you have to rely on the experience of, of the, the people doing it, recognizing if there's a particular nasty individual in there, that's really cranky, they want to make sure to close the cage, for, for example, when it's out. Otherwise, by the time you get started, there may be so many injuries on the monkey just because they're one animal. So, so these are things that are a bit hard to capture in protocols, but uh, uh, definitely fundamental to a successful, uh, peaceful operation. Um, the other thing is when, um, when you look at uh, other people's operations, uh, we, we often get asked and we often refuse because we, we can't go one day, look at somebody doing something and then decide if they do it well or not. You know, this is a long-term project. And we often have people, not, not so much, not just for monkeys, for monkeys we're not so bothered, but with other projects I've been involved with, I've had self-elected auditors, people you didn't ask, you don't necessarily think they have the expertise, but they somehow go there and give an opinion. And if that opinion is put on forum that matters or they carry a big name, suddenly you have to contend with that. So, so be also thoughtful when you, when you commission audits or when you commission inspections or you seek opinion on other people's projects. Make sure you choose people who can actually give an informed opinion and not just some people who are professional auditors, you know, expertologists. They show up, they tell everyone what to do. Uh, th those are actually detrimental because the project stops instead of improving. And then no no one benefits. So so just this a small small comment. So I... Oops. Uh, it sounds to me as though the programs that you're describing. Um, somebody also asked a question related to this. Um, they're sort of on a not a small scale, but they're they're in a very uh, limited geographical area which may be quite different from the situation that you're facing in different parts of India. I'm not sure, but with both of the programs you're describing, it sounds as though you have people there long-term who know quite well the individuals uh, involved. Otherwise you wouldn't be able to identify the cranky individual, <laughs> for example. Um, have I got that right? That's one question. Um, also, Sujana, you had a few questions that came up in the chat, and um, one was about, let's see, uh, a technical question about post-operative care. I think I had the impression that with the method you're using, it's very, very quick, but if you can talk about that, um, and about behavior inside the cage. So when monkeys are all trapped together in one cage, 
what is stopping them from kind of uh, getting super stressed and, and harming one another? That's several quite unrelated questions in one, but see where you can go with it. Um, I'll, I'll pick the first one. Uh, for where to place cages and the size of the area. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, Hong Kong is not India. And I think even within India, if you think about Himachal Pradesh or uh, Delhi, I'm sure it's a different situation. I think we speak about this very broadly that, you know, you cannot lump everything into a single, uh, you know, mitigation techniques, right? So even within Hong Kong, the range that we work with is very specific. We also have macaques in different areas, but there is no conflict. So therefore, we just leave that and we just observe it. Whereas in this particular area, you know, Lion Rock, Kamshan, Shing Moon area, where we have actually have range, uh, uh, we have mapped up the range of each of the individual troops. We know where they are. And we also know where they frequently visit. And that's where we strategically place the cages. So we don't just randomly put the cages somewhere and then expect the monkeys to come there, but we actually study the range of the monkeys first. So this is why that I feel that, you know, instead of starting a sterilization program, understand your population of macaques. You need to know who they are, where they are, you know, and, and who are the groups that's that. And, and the worst thing that you can also do, placing a cage and catching two troops together in a single cage. So this is why that the surveyors and that relationship is very, very important. Because if you put two uh, different rival troops within a cage, it's you better open that cage right there and then because cancel that surgery on that day, you know. So understanding your population is very, very important before you embark in any sterilization uh, program. <laughs> so that, and uh, about uh, then jumping within there, I think if it is a family group, of course, in the beginning, it's rather stressful, but they really settled down very quickly. And I think that uh, it was mentioned as well in the Ubud uh, projects that, you know, you put tarpaulin, you leave them down. When it's quiet, visually, they're content within their family group, they really settle down very, very quickly. So, but if you are noisy and you're opening everybody's peeping and looking and creating that stress, you know, that, that really agitate them. So you've got to be very mindful. The moment you, try, uh, you know, you, you close that door, you now now have a control environment and you've got to make sure that they're left peacefully in love. Yeah, and, then, and if, if uh, sorry, Paulo, go ahead. That was easy. Uh, yeah, if I just can add, um, so yeah, it's very surprising how they are quiet when they are trapped, when it's a single group, I mean, uh, definitely do not mix two different groups. So we, also identified groups, we know the home range, we know the individuals, and we close the door when we are sure that it's a single group. Okay, so that's really important. It takes a lot of time. Um, of course, identification work takes a lot of time. So, um, but it's surprising, they are very quiet. And if you have, sometimes you have like rebel individuals, like problem individuals, a big male, which which is quite aggressive. In this case, we, we try to squeeze him first. Um, so we always, uh, we try to select uh, which monkeys will uh, be s sorted and, and take out from the cage uh, at the beginning, um, generally the big, uh, the big males, of course. So we have kind of control on um, the aggressions inside uh, the cage. Yeah, that, that has been our experience also. And uh, if you... If you see some, some uh, quite often when we release, then some animals stay behind to finish the food that's there, or others that were outside would then come in the cage that's just been used to finish up the food. So it, it has to be become a place of uh, just just another place that they that they know. So not not necessarily something they're totally comfortable in, but not something that freaks them out uh, totally. On occasion, there are accidents happening. Maybe you, you, a particular animal has a particular bad experience on that day in the cage and he might not come back the next time, but that's an individual. It shouldn't be at the group level. Uh, in terms of when to release the animals and how long to keep them post-operatively, uh, like, like I said several times in, in, in my presentation, we insist on releasing them the same day on site and we refuse to 
to accept that the post-operative monitoring is helpful because it, it has been many people's experience that the longer you keep them, the more injuries you have. And then you keep them longer and then you get more injuries and it's a never ending story. And then you end up releasing macaques that have lost weight, that got injuries, have aborted, et cetera, et cetera. That doesn't happen here because we just release them the same day. Uh, it's really, really fundamental. The, the anesthetics are short acting. The procedure is short. They wake up together. They go out together that same day. So the if let's say we trap them typically around nine in nine eight thirty to to ten in the morning and then we typically release them before three or four uh, sometimes even uh, early afternoon they're already out so. and if i may uh, add something uh we can also have a post of following uh uh because we we, we mark them with the statue so it's easier to recognize which individual we catch and follow them outside after release uh, and to check the body condition, the evolution of the wound, if it's well healing or not, and, and so on. So. Great, fantastic. Um, we had a question about uh, different considerations for different species of macaque specifically. So. Here we have one project uh, working on long tail macaques. We have another project working on rhesus macaques, and we have another project working on both plus hybrids. So, um, uh, how different are your experiences with each different species? Related to that, I'm also interested to know um, in terms of what's happening in India, you talked about langurs as well as rhesus macaques. Um, and I'm curious to know whether these programs that you're concerned with, are they also capturing and sterilizing langurs? Are they treating them the same way? And if, if not, why not? And what do you know about that? So maybe we can start there and then move on to the existing programs and talk about differences between how, how it goes with different species of macaque. Yeah. So um, the sterilization happens more with uh, rhesus macaques, not langurs. We don't have that population of langurs. Okay. And uh, the second thing is that uh, the rhesus macaques are more aggressive. So we also receive more complaints for rhesus macaques. Okay. Uh, and langurs are, you know, they are not at all aggressive. And uh, to the extent that some people feed groups of langurs and, you know, those langurs will come sit very peacefully, calmly in the village and people can feed and they just go off, you know, sit on the uh, uh, treetops and again, you know, come back. So the interaction between langurs and people is much more uh, cordial, I would say. Uh, but re with rhesus macaques, even if people are feeding, they are not very friendly there is a tendency to be, uh, you know, much more aggressive. So langur population is less, plus they are uh, friendlier. Okay. And, uh, but uh, the sterilization happens with rhesus macaques. Okay, thank you. Dinesh, you want to add something? No, it is, I mean, that's true. Thank you. What about uh, differences then between working with rhesus, long tail macaques, and hybrids? Um, are there marked differences? Um, and in fact, how does that even work uh, in 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 troops? I mean, are there are there troops that consist of both species and hybrids together, or are they separate? I'm I'm not sure how that works in Hong Kong. Uh, I think by, by this point, uh, the genetics are totally mixed match. It's been 60 years, so um, it's, it's, it's not possible by looking at, the, at one of them to say if it's a pure one or the other or how much of a hybrid it is. So I think we can consider all hybrids and then just like the different phenotypes and, and so forth. And um, in terms of uh, species differences, I mean, there's no doubt that different species have different characteristics, but also let's not forget cultural differences. 
because even even within our uh, our small area that we work in there are some troops that are particularly tough and warrior like and even the females look like males and then other troops that are very gentle little souls and uh, just mind their own business and they, their behavior is markedly different so the cultural difference is typically driven uh, something you mentioned even when people are feeding them they're not friendly is especially when people are feeding them they're not friendly because the 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 whole nastiness is a result of begging i mean from asking to begging to demanding it is the same thing it's just a slightly broader insistence on the request right so it, it actually teaches them to be aggressive uh to when people feed them so there's nothing good can come from the, from feeding uh, monkeys and um I suspect that the cultural differences between troops or the, the learned behavior on how to obtain food from people may be broader than the actual difference between species, but I, I, I can't say for sure. Um, maybe I just think about one big difference between, between long-tailed macaques and rhesus macaques is for contraception is uh, the seasonality of reproduction. So it should be taken into account when you plan um, your strategy for captures. So in the case of the long-tailed macaques, they are not seasonal, at least in Bali. Um, and no, I mean, uh, it's not a seasonal species, but in some locations we have some peaks of uh, birth. Um, but that means females can be pregnant all year, uh, uh, wrong. So there is no good period uh, to catch um, long-tailed macaques, and maybe it can be easily managed with the uh, rhesus macaques, which are more seasonal. Thank you very much. Um, jumping around just a little bit, um, but obviously. Paolo, you were just talking about people feeding macaques and that, you know, access to food is is like the root cause of most of these problems. Um, but feeding monkeys may be really, really culturally ingrained in certain places. And, and it may be something that isn't going to stop, like just isn't going to stop. So um, speak, I, I think this may be the case in Bali. Is that correct? Fanny and Gwenin. Does people feed monkeys? Is, 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 it, is, it, is it a very strong cultural tradition that, that just isn't going to change? So my impression is that in Hong Kong, for example, it's not like a, a, a really, really old thing that people do as, as sort of part of their everyday culture. It's just that the monkeys are there, so they feed them. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Bali, it may have religious significance or, or really yeah. old cultural significance. So you can't reasonably ask people, just stop feeding the monkeys. Yeah, it's very difficult yeah. uh, because especially in Bali, they are Hindu. So uh, like, just like in India, so monkeys are sacred and uh, feeding monkeys is really part of the cultural practice. So it's yeah. really difficult to, to, to ban food provisioning. Even if people understand that it's the cause of the problem, they will be uh, reluctant to, to stop feeding monkeys because they believe they don't have enough food. Plus in the case of the monkey forest, you know, it's a touristic site. So they want to have monkeys there to have visitors coming. So it's also an economic, um, reason why they feed monkeys every day and, and, and regularly. So we try to work with the um, uh, food provisioning regulation with the stakeholders and it's really difficult to, we, we try at least to, to advise them to decrease the quality of the food they provide because it can have an impact on the fecundity rate. I mean, if monkeys have plenty of food, of course, they will produce better um, as everywhere. So, um, it's really difficult. Yeah, bigger question. There's not necessarily a straight way around that. You just have to work with what you've got, I suppose. It, it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, if there are no other comments on that, uh, yes. yeah, on, yeah, go on, ahead, on that, please. On that, if I can say, uh, in Hong Kong, also people love feeding the monkeys, and uh, it, it hasn't it hasn't slowed down, and it doesn't look like it's going to. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, if we look at the the, uh, the reports from our surveyors on a weekly basis, there's still a lot of people bringing food. Any time of the day you go, there'll be people feeding. So I, I think for whatever reason, people do something silly. It's always okay and totally rational to tell them they're doing something silly, whether they're doing it for religious reasons or just for other reasons. If you're doing something that is causing problem, it's okay to point it out. Um, whether they'll stop it or not is, is a different question. And if they don't stop it for whatever reason, there's not one that's excusable, the other not. It's just that you take into the reality that it's going to continue. So your, your plan has to take into consideration that people will feed monkeys. And in, in Japan, uh, I haven't been myself, but I've heard of a, of a place where people love to go and feed monkeys and they've made a special place. And that's where you feed the monkeys, nowhere else. So if you feed the monkey somewhere else, you get fine, you get harassed by the local authorities who actually enforce the regulation. But if you're in that location, you can. So the monkeys being smarter than, than, than that, they go there and they wait for the food there and they don't expect food somewhere else. So there are ways around that as well. And they could be applicable to, to temples, to parks, uh, etc. It's not applicable to waste management. That's, that's a different story altogether. But to people provisioning food voluntarily, out of the goodness of the heart to fulfill some religious obligation, whatever reason they have, it's okay. I think it's possible to manage that situation in a way that doesn't increase conflict. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was a question about um, the most effective or best option for cont contraception in captive settings. And I think that that's probably a subject for a whole workshop in itself. Um, part of my own background is working with captive primates, and I know that there are quite strong opinions about what's best and the different reasons for that. However, um, I just don't want to completely skip over that. Um, so if, if anybody has some, you know, fairly broad basic information about that to share now that would be really appreciated and i think we will if if there's enough interest in this as a subgroup we'll we'll continue talking about this and we'll focus more closely on uh captivity contraception uh, in the future maybe we need to concentrate on that later <laughs> okay uh, let's see, we just have a look at my... Oh yeah, okay, so moving on from that, we can come back to that if anybody decides they wanted to give some input there. Um, so I think this was addressed in a couple of your presentations, but maybe you can talk a little uh, more about this. We're talking about using contraception to stop population growth or to, uh, you know, keep populations stable or whatever. Um, how has that actually translated in your experience into r reducing actual negative interactions as opposed to uh, people's perceptions and all that? Is there, is there any knowledge about that? Who am I gonna pick on first? <laughs> Philip, do you have something to say about that in relation to the Hong Kong program? Mm, I can only say um, at the very beginnings, um, lots of publics uh, will keep questioning the effectiveness of the contraceptive program because yeah. each time when they travel to Kamsan Country Parks, when they see the influence, they will uh, they will question why your programs uh, I should say, your program is supposed to sterilize the monkey, so no infant should be seen during their visit. But this is wrong because the conscious program itself is to control or manage the populations in a steady, uh, uh, in a steady way, but not to uh, get rid of them because all the wild, uh, all the wild markets in Hong Kong is protected. So. I think um, the pro uh, the conscious set program itself is, as as mentioned, is one one of the approach to 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 
to alleviate the conflicts. But ultimate goals is the public understanding mm -hmm. that a uh, monkey is in the wild and they need to get used to it. And as a government, we need to balance uh, as we have received the nuisance, we can capture the monkeys and do the conscious uh, and do the surgeries and send it back to the countryside. And for the monkeys, we provide good habitat by planting trees, educating publics on a good manners to deal with wild animals. And this is, and, and also we have a good collaborators or ocean park conservation foundations, good, uh, provide constructive advice, uh, doing surgeries on the monkeys. I think, um, I could say this is one of the, um, uh, 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 the, 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 um, lucky things that we have in Hong Kong to get a, a, a kind of good results through the uh, monkey management and also in the conscious air program. Yeah. Can anybody add to that? Yeah, um, I'll add to that. I think, uh, I think we've had this discussion as well, Brooke, but when people ask what is your program successful? And my question is, what do you mean? What is the definition of success here? Yes. So, you know, and, and we have to be very clear that contraception program is to reduce birth rate. It got nothing to do with conflict mitigation per se. So, you know, a monkey that's been sterilized is not going to be stealing, uh, stop stealing today. The, the behavior itself, it's, it's not going to change, right? If your waste management doesn't work. So you have to look at this contraception program as just a part of a bigger mitigation program, you know? And, and also I think that um, in a way, which, which I feel that I think Fiona mentioned that as well, that what are we doing for relationship of humans to other animals that we share this planet with. I think it's very important because we seem to be correcting and managing the behavior of every other animal that overlaps with us. Whereas the issue, you know, is us. And when are we gonna be managing the human behavior around these animals as well? And I think that, you know, this is something that I feel that is also lacking. And we always, for example, if there is a complaint, we immediately react to the complaint and remove the animals. Whether in Hong Kong, we also have uh, issues with wild pigs. You know, we, we then uh, mitigate that. But what about all the feeders? What about the, you know, waste management that we've not managed? The human behavior, throwing rubbish everywhere. Have we dealt with that as well? So I feel that, you know, sometimes there is imbalances. So when we think about this question, is it, you know, contraception program, um, and, and also that public has to understand when we do contraception program, we are not trying to terminate every single birth. We are managing the population so the birth rate is not too high. So I feel that a lot more education, information, and the correct information should go out there. And even as simple as labeling animals as vermin, pest, I feel that, you know, we are shifting that balance of narratives here. So I think we have to correct this narrative. And I think it's really, really important at the core of coexistence of sharing this planet. This is, you know, a shared planet. Yeah. Sorry, a bit philosophical. But yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to one uh, quite technical question from Anne Bu. And I'll just read it out the way it was written. Um, she's asked if any transient males were sterilized or do you have any insights on the impact of sterilizing transient males? She says she's asking in the context of Singapore where transient males get trapped for relocation as a result of conflict. In the process, they may get sterilized as it's seen as an opportunity but this could potentially impact gene flow in a small island country's population. Let's ask Fanny and Gwenin to start with that one. Okay. Um, 
So the question of uh, in, in, in breeding risk and um, the loss of uh, genetic diversity is, is often uh, asked, of course, and actually I do not have uh, the expertise to really answer um, for that. I think our strategy is to target females, especially because di genetic diversity is maintained by male migration. But of course, in uh, isolated populations, just like in, in Ubud, where the forest corridors are quite uh, sparse and, and not enough, uh, we do not know, actually, we, we, we do not know the current genetic um, uh, status of the population. There had been war conducted by Fuentes, uh, Augustine Fuentes uh, t 10 years ago or 15 years ago about the, the genetic diversity and it looks like this population is less diversified genetically speaking than other populations in, in Bali. So definitely it's something that we have to, to work on. But I think before, um, how to say that, before getting in breeding problem, we, we probably um, have a lot of time. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not an expert in genetics, so. Thank you. Um, Carthy and Paolo, anything to say about that? <clears throat> um, same as Fanny, I'm no geneticist, uh, and um, I don't, uh, I don't presume to know what the what the future of Singapore macaques will be. But uh, the transient males, whether you sterilize them or not, is not going to make a dent in the population growth and in the population. Uh, fertility. So from the point of view of uh, being prudent about things, you might as well not sterilize them because like, like Fanny pointed out, the males wandering about are a source of genetic diversity that the, the females don't, uh, don't have since they tend to stay in one place more. Uh, and since it's not going to have an impact in terms of increasing the population, and uh, you might as well not sterilize them. So that's purely from the practical point of view. Yeah. I don't have a scientific answer for that, just a pragmatic uh, approach. Anybody else have anything to say about this one? Okay, um, I'm going to start wrapping up the session now and, and the event, in fact. Um, but I'd like to ask each person on the panel to sort of wrap up what they have to say about what we've learned today. Um, and also just bearing in mind a question that you may or may not be able to answer, but if, um, if there's somebody in a particular location where there are problems related to negative interactions or perceived overpopulation or whatever, and they want to do something about it, and they think that sterilization or contraception of some sort is the proper approach, what advice would you give them? And yeah, so if, if, if you can bear that in mind while wrapping up the day, uh, I don't know who I should call on first. I'm going to close my eyes and choose Gwenin. <laughs> you, you get to go first. And, and thank you very much for everything today, all of you. Uh, I don't know exactly how to start uh, with uh, this question. Um, um, if you don't have an answer to that question, it doesn't matter. You can also just kind of summarize summarize what you've got out of the day. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, actually, I think it's uh, uh, this kind of program sterilization is really we we should look at uh, a lot as a long-term process as uh, paulo uh, say uh, many times and not only on the short term because people most of the time uh, think they want uh, immediate solution to that problem and there is no immediate solution yeah and there is only a long-term solution and as uh, they say also it's uh, really uh, important to consider the sterilization will not stop the conflict. They 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 will just um, 
how do you say that um, avoid the conflict still uh, keep going increasing it's just to limit the conflict uh, by limiting the number of uh, monkeys creating the conflict but it will not solve the the the, the behaviors of the market so it's a, a global picture as we we say before uh, it's not just sterilization it's a combination of all uh, different programs of sterilization, but also the uh, public education and uh, exchange with local communities and with government and and so on. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, before we go on, uh, I missed a question, and I'm just going to read it out and and hope somebody can answer this. Um, we're talking about. Uh, macaque breeding facilities for labs and other commercial use. Um, ha have you had any pushback or discussion with any of them in light of the fact that they may be interested in capturing and taking monkeys for research? Is Has, has this been an experience of any of you? Uh, it's, it's a nest, it's a nest of vipers. Uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> uh, First of all, there should be no, there should not be any laundering of wild macaque through capture integrated into uh, legal suppliers and finding their way to the civilized pharmaceutical labs. Uh, I know it's common practice. We all know it's common practice. Some of us live in countries where entire industries are dedicated to that practice. It's still not good practice and most of the time it's still illegal practice. There are some exceptions and uh, those exceptions are usually in uh, countries or islands where the animals do not belong and have been introduced and they're managed that way. But within their home range, uh, it's not considered acceptable or even legal to go out, catch some monkeys, put them in a farm, give them a tattoo or a chip and call them captive born and integrate them. That's kind of a giant uh, scam and it's a multi-million dollar scam. It's a problem. Uh, so those labs, the last thing they're going to do is come out in the open and say, oh, by the way, I'm catching those animals. Uh, do you <laughs> mind not uh, Do you mind not doing that? So I would say that conversation doesn't take place. And I, I personally would feel quite sorry for a guy coming up to me with that question. Um, so no, it, it's not happening. Um, it should. It, it also shouldn't happen. I mean, uh, the the increase in demand is one thing, and we we all saw that depressing slide where macaques are now endangered. Uh, they used to be pests most of the time, the long tail, and it's it's the worst, most predictable thing that has happened, and it's it's, it's tragic. It will happen for the rest. The next ones, the reasons, and so forth. So no, it shouldn't. I, I think that paradigm should not be the way we think about the, these questions. Uh, we, we've released all these vaccines with zero experimentation uh, just just uh, because we could. So I think let's keep doing that, you know, and uh, leave the monkeys alone and wait till it will be my fun. Thank you. Any other thoughts on that subject? And if not, um, maybe Paolo and Carthy, you can just carry on sort of just wrapping up what you have to say from this session and we'll take it from there. Yeah, I, I just want to say thank you. Uh, it was just so enlightening to 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 hear all these stories and 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 I understand that you know uh, the the issues everywhere. We can we can talk about conflict mitigation, but you know the issues in India in and and also urban rural livelihood is so different. And and I feel that each one of the situations should be treated as such and not blanket approach. You know. Uh, kind of mitigation. You can probably have guidelines, but you still have to tailor it to the local context. I think it's really important. And I think that, Brooke, you were saying that if people want to start, uh, they think it's overpopulation. My advice is don't start the program until you have established that it is indeed overpopulation. Because as we've seen in long tail macaques, we think we perceive overpopulation. We've been destroying habitats. They've been spilling over to earth shed spaces and we think it's overpopulation, but are they? You know, so let's not get into that pathway. Define your senses and then find, and, and, and as mentioned as well, the well thought through uh, management plan. Have you done your waste management? Tailor each of the uh, program into the local situation. Sterilization could be right at the 
I think you've frozen now. Yeah, I'm, I'm also very, very pleased okay. to have the chance to, to meet with you and uh, share some uh, thoughts and some uh, some of your, the challenges you face with these species. Um, I, I think the, uh, the takeaway message for me is that we still have a lot of uh, a lot of um, delays in uh, you know the things that people have learned in India that we don't know here things we know here that haven't been uh, learned in India and so forth and it's, it's good to have these kind of meetings once in a while just to say oh yeah they've been doing that for 20 years I never thought about it wow you know so so this is really where where it comes and it's not something that is publishable or that is uh, that you can find by by browsing. So this one we have to be face to face, and and, and you get some enlightenment on other people from other people's problems. So that that's kind of the the takeaway. Uh, and another thing I I like to insist on is that you know make sure you you confine you confine your interventions to your expertise. Don't don't spill over. Uh, we all do obviously we all have strong opinions on anything uh, just separate what is actual technical advice from what's your opinion and and, and i think it, it keeps the projects moving forward better great thank you um dinesh do, have you got final words for the day yeah of course uh thank you brooke and thank you all of you uh for sharing your experiences and expertise I learned a lot of things and uh, many uh, questions uh, going in my mind when uh, once we finish this, we may discuss at our organization with the different people. So, uh, so the first learning is, I mean, what I learn is this is not a reactive program. I mean, we should not take a reactive approach. It's a longitudinal program which takes a lot of time. But what happened in India, uh, whatever the examples we have quoted, that if something has happened somewhere in the state or in particular region of any conflict happened, then people or the government start, you know, uh, finding the solutions. So that is a reactive approach will not work. So there should be some systematic longitudinal or the long term uh, program should be run. And what the my on a, Paulo and uh, from Hong Kong, what she said, it's a very, very focus. It's, it's not the conflict approach. It's a animal birth control program. So that needs to be defined what we want. So that's what I, uh, it's uh, my learning. We need to under, we need to first fix whether we want to reduce the conflict, whether we want to reduce the birth control or what. So as she mentioned, it, well, we should not use a blanket approach. It's a very contextual. So that is the, uh, I mean, very important learning uh, or take home message for me. And for that, thank you. Thank you all of you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Fanny, would you like to say some final words for the day? Thank you. Terima <laughs> kasi. Um, no, I just, would like to say that it could be a very uh, nice opportunity this workshop to try to uh, produce something uh, publish together um, uh, gather all data and experience we, we have on different programs different species different approach and yeah if we can if we are able to even if there are many differences there are also some convergence can we say that in english I mean, be, between uh, sites, species, and um, local context, and so on. So it would be very great if we can um, move forward, make a step forward, and and publish something that could provide some. I don't know. I don't talk about guidelines, but at least best practice or kind of a decision tree um, that may uh, inform management decision for future uh, program. Yeah. That's a fantastic idea. And um, following this meeting, I can try to, uh, you know, keep the conversation going about that, um, as well as other things. So great. Good. We'll stay in touch. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Sejana, what would you like to say to close? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I did not expect this uh, 
conversation to go you know it it was a very exciting conversation it was there was so much learning for me uh, personally and uh, uh, i would say that um, it has been an eye opener and there are a lot of things that we understood uh, you know looking at the finer details of the programs in india that we are missing because the programs are undertaken by the government and i really see the difference you know the how the organizations uh, ngos doing these programs what kind of uh, input they are giving and uh, how the programs in india are going so i see uh, that as a, a federation we uh, really uh, need to see the finer details of how the government is operating these programs and are they taking into consideration what polo and uh, his colleague mentioned uh those finer details the reasons of conflict and definitely the population um in india the census uh, you can't uh, rely so much on the census data the government uh, collected the census so i really think that uh, the problem may lie somewhere uh, number one issue is uh, the in india is waste management and that is uh, even for dog population control we have faced those issues there are several recommendations uh but you know it is a difficult uh area to operate um so but definitely you know lot of learning um from the hong kong program i can't you know i can't even explain that how what an eye opener it has been so there we will uh you know try to gather more data is all i can say we will come back to the hong kong team and you know get more inputs and have a finer look at our indian uh, programs and uh, you know do everything in our capacity to uh, reduce these cruelties that are happening so thank you so much everyone thank you so much for such you know wonderful insights and your ex- sharing your experiences and your inputs thank you so much thank you thank you very much um finally philip Uh, would you like to say anything to close out the day? You're the last speaker of the last session of the day. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for all. And indeed, um, uh, I think um, after listening all the presentations, I do think managing monkey population in the wild um, is a very difficult issues, or I should say, leads lots of. Um, knowledge manpower and money but yeah it, i i should say i i am I, we we are very lucky to have a alliance a strong alliance to work together pulling in different kind of knowledge and i think this is uh the most important issues that lead to successful story in hong kong and uh, this is uh, also what i want to say um Uh, to work out a plan, collaborations is better than complain. And this is what I learned in the past through uh, the conscious life programs. And yeah, I hope this is uh, yeah um, uh, kind of uh, sharing with you rather than yeah yeah sharing yeah just it just sharing. Thank you so very much, all of you. Um, you were just talking about collaboration, and yeah, of course, th- that's the whole reason that the AFA coalition exists is to encourage people to collaborate across their specific I- their specific interests and slightly differing opinions on things uh, and different areas of expertise. But but in general, everybody involved is is working towards the same. main thing and um the more we can talk about it together the the more we can do so we're about half an hour early but i think it's time to end today's event we've we've discussed a lot we've taken in a lot and we've all got a lot of digesting to do um as you know this session was recorded and it was also live streamed on youtube um and there were a number of people watching that at the time and of course it's going to remain available there for for people to refer to at any point whenever they need to see it so um you know please invite anybody who needs to to go have a look um i will follow up 
with everybody who attended by email afterwards. But I just want to remind you that the AFA Coalition, we have our Slack uh, channel there that, that you can have ongoing conversations uh, about this and other subjects there. And that's it. Okay, we're all finished. Thanks everybody for coming and we'll all be in touch. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.